welcome to Semper Sometimes with <laughs> Benny. So um, we're just hopping right in it. Um, so welcome, Gunnery Sergeant Ralph Yajima. Yajama, is, is it Yajima? Yajima. Y- Yajama. I, I, yeah. The reason why I wanted to start it off like that is because I've had so many people say that it's not one yeah, or yeah. the other, yeah. and I've known you for long enough yeah. to the point where like I think maybe I've been messing it up for yeah. years. So which one is it? Yajama. Yajama. Yeah. Oh, so I am right. Yeah. Okay. Because people be saying like that's not what his name is. I'm like, no, 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 it is. I mean, everyone has a different variation. <laughs> I think I'm at the point where I don't even care. If I <laughs> acknowledge, I think that's more than enough for me, right? It's like, oh, you've noticed me. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take it. All right, whatever. Yeah. So um, I want to just first thank you for being the first 8412 that I've had on my podcast. Um, and I think it's awesome that you're the first one because I've had other people reach out and or say that we're going to come on and then things come up because you guys have busy lives. Yeah. Right? And um, I think it's awesome that you're the first person. Uh, it was supposed to Master Master Graver Sergeant Rudin was supposed oh. to come on. Um, but things got in the way and then I don't know what happened, but now you're here, yeah. which is more important. So, um, what, I, what I really want to talk to you about before we even get into anything really is who is Ralph? That is a question. That, mm. is, that is quite a question. Mm. I'm still trying to figure that out myself. <laughs> uh, uh, who is Ralph? Um, I guess I was born and raised in the Bronx until I was 17, moved back to New Jersey, uh, 18 with family, and then um, joined the Marine Corps a year later. Uh, then been in the Marine Corps now for 17 years. And um, I don't know. I'm still really trying to figure that out, but I just follow <laughs> myself, you know. So, yeah, you know. So, still trying to figure that out. I guess, uh, who am I? Uh, a Marine, a father, uh, a son, um, you know, a Christian. Um, let's see what else. I like to still consider myself an athlete, mm-hmm. although, you know, sometimes I'm in a lot of pain. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I, I think all those things kind of encompass. Uh, myself and, and who I am, mm-hmm. who I believe I am internally. I have no idea. I'm still trying to figure that out myself. I guess once I get out the Marine Corps, right? Yeah. You know, I'll figure out the next stage of my life on who do I become at that point in time. Mm-hmm. But, uh, for now, I'm a uh, Ralph Yajama, Gunner Sergeant Marine Corps, 8412. Uh, 17 years in, RS New Jersey, uh, Staff Sergeant Chief for RSS South Jersey. Mm-hmm. I guess that's who I am now. How long? How long have you been a uh, 8412? Well, how long have you been on recruiting duty? So, so I have split time, right? So. Uh, I was out here in 2009 and 2012, 2012, 2014, went back out to the fleet, uh, deployed during that time frame, and then 2014, uh, till now, been back out here, uh, became an 8412 in 2017. So 2017 till now is when I've been in Oh, crap, I didn't know that. So right yeah. when I met you was when yeah. you had just become an 8412. Yeah, pretty much. I had no idea. Yeah, so literally like right when I, I had, thought uh, I thought you back. were a seasoned 8412 at that no, point. No, no, I, I had just came back from CRC uh, crew recruiting course. Um, when I met oh, you, so, yeah. yep. Wow. So I was a brand new eighty four twelve at that point. I had no um, idea. And then, uh, and then obviously been an eighty four twelve since then. Wow. Yeah. So what, what made you? So how long in the Marine Corps were you when you first got histed? Yeah, I was. Uh, so I was in Iraq, and I, uh, I had just reenlisted, and they put me on a deferred option because I was denied recruiting duty since I was just a corporal at the time. Uh, so they put me on a deferred option, say you're gonna, we're gonna keep you around. You have a year to figure it out. Um, I get promoted to sergeant right when I get back uh, on April 1st, so I thought it was a joke. Uh, April 1st, I get promoted to sergeant, and then uh, sure enough, I get the phone call, hey, you've been histed. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, I don't even want to do recruiting anymore. I actually want to go MSG now. Oh, so, you know, at that time, I was, I was a single young lad. I was like, you know, I, I want to go MSG. I don't want to go recruiting. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so then they're like, yeah, now you're going recruiting. And then uh, here, here I am. <laughs> so that was like my first, that was my first, and the, end, the tail end of my first enlistment. Mm. Um, and so where was that at? Where I was at? Yeah. I was in North Carolina. Okay. I was the three, uh, one eight. Yeah. No, where, I'm sorry. Where were you on recruiting? Where'd you go? Recruiting? Oh, recruiting. Yeah. So once I get out here on recruiting, <clears throat> I came out to uh, RSS Middlesex. Oh, so you came out here. Yeah. Then went back to the fleet and then requested to come back to Jersey. Yes. Yep, oh, exactly. shit. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I knew. I knew when I left, I wanted to be an eighty four twelve. I just, I wanted to deploy. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to deploy. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to stay and not be like, oh man, I wish I would have deployed, you know? Um, so I wanted to go back. So that was like my biggest goal, to go back, go deploy, and then come back afterwards, which is obviously what I did. Okay. So now I'm confused. Mm. Because, so in the Middlesex office, mm-hmm. there's all those plaques, yeah, yeah. and your name's on a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah. 
That was the first time or the second time? That was that with, was the combination. That was the combination. Oh. That was the first time and second time. Mm. A lot of the uh, the brown and, and gold ones, yeah. those are all the old ones from when I was first hired, 2009 oh, time frame, okay. everything like that. And then uh, some of the other ones afterwards were mm. was when you know I, I came back out in, uh, was that, 14, uh, in, uh, in 2014. Got so. you. Okay. So... What was it? So you said that the first time you knew you wanted to be a 12, yeah. but you wanted to go back, hit the fleet again, right. get that. So what was it that made you know that you wanted this life? Because most people, like you yeah. know, can't stand people that want to be 12. Right, or right. they're like, bro, you're batshit crazy. Right, um, yeah. That's the, you know, the rumor mill. So I, what, I think the, the funniest part is, is uh, I didn't want to be an 84 12 when I first came out here. You know, sometimes you have a lot of guys come out here brand new, like, oh, I'm an 84 12, blah, blah. I didn't want that. I just wanted to be... I, I didn't want to let my staff so I see uh, at the time, freaking Staff Sergeant Rodriguez, uh, now Mass Sergeant Rodriguez, Op Chief over in uh, San Diego. Uh, I didn't want to let him down. That's really what it came down to this in the day. I didn't want to fail. I didn't want to let him down. I had heard and seen. Oh, wait, how so many, he was your first staff? He was staff. my staff so I see, yeah. What? Yeah. So I, did, I wanted to be like him. Yeah. He was recruited the nation. Like, yeah, yeah, I yeah. wanted that. Yeah. So I strived and I did everything I could to be like that, yeah. to, you know, to be as good as, as, good as he is. Um, so that was really like my, my, my goal. Now, he didn't become an 8412 either right away. He went back out to the fleet. Oh. And then he came back out, went to Florida, and became an 8412 out of Florida. Mm-hmm. So uh, seeing that example, I was like, well, I can do that too, because he's an infantry marine, I'm an infantry marine, he deployed, I want to deploy. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, for lack of better words, I was trying to follow in that idea of I could still go back out of the fleet and still become an 8412. Mm-hmm. I knew I wanted to be an 8412, probably maybe, maybe nine, ten months into doing it. Uh, and I knew that because I got to see the change in the kids I was working with. I was working with the kids from New Brunswick, uh, some kids from East Brunswick, Votec, you know, East Brunswick, North Brunswick area. So I, I got to see a lot of a lot of kids in that area, and then their 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 lives change, you know, for the better, mm-hmm. and do a lot of different things that they want to do. Or at least I can say for the better, right? I mean, unless they want something opposite. Um, but uh, I got to see that, and and that on its own was like I, I enjoy this. So that was like the the half of it that I saw. Once I became a staff officer, I see, and I saw the other half of hey, not everyone's gonna stay out here and go back out, you know, go, uh, you know, become an eighty four twelve. They're gonna go back out to the fleet. Me going back out to the fleet myself, I got to see the transition of a marine recruiter going back out to the fleet, and the initial struggles that we're gonna face, um, physically speaking, going out there. We're not gonna be as PT subs as everyone else in the fleet who wakes up at you know zero five PT and stuff like that because we don't do that on military duty, yeah. right? So. You know, seeing see, seeing that was one like one of the biggest things I said like that pushed me saying I need to come back out here because I want to ensure that when I send my Marines back out to the fleet mm-hmm. that they're prepared in all aspects to go back out to the yeah. fleet because not everyone's gonna stay out here for recruit duty and become an eight four twelve. And I, and I I think that's a huge. I'm thankful that you said that because people forget that. Yeah. And as and you know not talking crap about eight four twelves, but a lot of them forget that because they didn't go back to the fleet. Right. And they, they just stayed out here the rest of their career. And, and a lot of it, like, you talk to these guys, like, I'm, I'm, I'm in touch with them, and so are you. Mm-hmm. But you talk to them about that transition period, and right. it's like, part people feel like, hey, the Marine Corps recruiting duty is not the Marine Corps anymore. Right. So it's like you got out of the Marine Corps, mm-hmm. and you're now going back in. Right. And the transition period of just normal work hours yeah. to being with your family to PTing to eating normally to having a diet again. Mm-hmm. Like, all those things are just, it's really like nobody thing. encompasses those on, on recruiting duty. Yeah. Um, Sadly. Yeah. And so so you think that a lot of the reason why you are the leader that you are is because of the fact that you went back to the fleet and came back? Yeah. Yeah, I got to say, I think going back out to the fleet helped me out big time. And, and kind of, because I got married, so I was promoted out here on recruiting duty. So mm-hmm. I became a staff sergeant out here in, in, in recruiting duty, not in the fleet. So being a staff sergeant on recruiting duty is a lot different than being a staff sergeant in the fleet, you know? Especially when you have higher echelon that you're really responsible to and have to be accounted to and everything like that. I hear recruiting duty really. I have a, a major that I that I account to, yeah. uh, and I have a sergeant major as well, and I have an RI master yeah. sergeant and everything like that. Yet at the end of the day, the person I truly truly report to is the major. The He's the one officer. I can walk right into his office, and say, "Sir, check it out." Yeah. Um, whereas in the fleet, my higher ups at that point in time was uh, was a, a gun a platoon sergeant, uh, was a platoon commander. Uh, the platoon commander was a friggin' uh, a, a lieutenant. Uh, my uh, my platoon commander or platoon sergeant was a gunny, and we didn't even have a platoon sergeant when I got out to the fleet. So I really I was dual had as a platoon sergeant and the uh, and the squad leader uh, because I was in weapons company. 
So it's a little different the way our structure works. Um, and then from there, we had a company gunny. Then we had a, uh, a uh, an operations uh, mass sergeant. Then we had uh, freaking the XO. Then I had the CO. CO was the captain. XO was the lieutenant. So here I am. I, I dealt with a major, you know, for pretty much two years on recruiting duty. And now I'm dealing with a captain. Mm-hmm. No offense to a captain, but I mean, again, I'm talking to a major and a captain, a little different. And then I have to go through all the different echelons to even get to that captain to say anything. Uh, so it was, it was, uh, it was interesting to say the least. And then the physical fitness aspect is now I'm, I'm dealing with Marines who have been through food training. They're not like the kids that we get nowadays who maybe aren't physically fit. We work out with them and we're for the most part going to be freaking better than 99% of them. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have those ones and twos that are going to be freaking studs, right? Um, so now you have the majority of the the guys that are in your squad, they're, they're not PT studs, but they're, they're good. They've been working out daily consistently and everything like that. So now you're like behind the pack, but then you're the one who's supposed to be in charge. So it's like, how is it that you're like the guy's falling back out on the run and you're not the one in front needing to run, that kind of thing, you know? So um, it was a struggle going back out to the fleet and, and seeing that whole other world again, especially when I had left. I had left as a, a brand new sergeant. Mm. I was maybe a sergeant for maybe five, six months, if that. Uh, so I was a brand new sergeant in the fleet. So uh, having an opportunity to go back out to the fleet uh, as a staff sergeant, run a squad, be responsible for all these different things, and, and uh, do all that, I, I think it was huge because it really showed me what leadership was uh, when it came to being in charge of 12, 13 Marines, not police, because police have their families that are still responsible for them. Yeah. I'm not responsible for this Lance Corporal, PFC yeah. private in the barracks. I'm their mom. I'm their dad. I'm everything mm-hmm. to them at that point in time. So it was a lot different, and uh, I think it was huge. And then it helped me to stay in the mindset of when I got back out on the recruit duty second time around, what was the difference? There was no difference. It was still the fleet. I was just on, on recruiting duty. Was, I'm, what, what is the difference? I'm just on a long ass deployment. That's that's all it is. <laughs> you know, it's just a long ass deployment. I'm always gone. I'm always out. There's always an attack. There's always something going on. I'm always preparing for something. Whereas in the fleet, you have the downtime. Yeah. Right. You're already training for a workup. You go deploy. You come back. You relax a little bit. You're not going all crazy. And then boom, you get ready to freaking work up again. And now you deploy again. And you have that cycle. Yeah. Out here on recruiting duty, there there is no there's no downtime. Yeah. Um, quote unquote no downtime. Mm-hmm. There should be downtime. And that's where, knowing what I know now from the fleet, I'm taking over here, I, I believe has helped me to be more successful had I not gone back out of the fleet. I don't know what I could have done or, yeah. or where I would have been. Yeah, and the reason why I ask you that is because, well, two reasons. Well, one, that's a conversation I've had earlier on in other episodes, is that like I personally believe, and I've had this discussion with other people, that there's, there's different types of leadership, mm-hmm. and that the leadership that you have in the fleet is not the leadership you can have out here. Right. That's my opinion. Mm-hmm. Because I think that it's very different for you to be the, the staff and CIC of an office than it is for you to do anything else out in the fleet Marine Corps. Right. So I think that, like, and, and, I, and honestly, I learned that from you because, like, you know, and part of the things I wanted to ask you is, like, because people have a difference of opinion, of course, when it comes to anything, but, like, you were a very different... Unfortunately, I only got to work with you for like three months, I think, um, before I went out to um, BRC, uh, Basic Recruiters Course. But, you know, the, and I was talking to Sergeant, Staff Sergeant Rodriguez about this earlier, um, and it was just, you were a very different boss because you were, well, in my opinion, you weren't a boss, you were a staff and CIC. Yeah. You know, there's bosses and then yeah. there's staff and CIC. Exactly. Um, and the thing is, is that the way that you just portrayed yourself was like, if you were in the office... We were in the office. Right. If we were in the office, you were in the office. Like I don't remember there ever being a time where you weren't in the office. Right. And like, and, and and it was also just the way of like the the accountability piece. Like I remember, you know, like when we first got out there, and I was just the, I was an EAD, or I wasn't even a recruiter yet. And I hadn't even gone to school yet. You watched me make phone calls. You will know. You showed me how to make phone yeah. calls, and then you had me make phone right. calls. And the, just the way that you went about your training and the fact that you took training seriously every single Friday, mm-hmm. even throughout the week, you would stop the work day to do training. Yeah. And I think that that's a huge part of Marine Corps recruiting duty that's no longer there. Right. Um, I think that it's, you know, and we've thought, I thought about it before, is that a lot of the times it's just, you know, paper pushed or it's just fixed for, you know, whatever reason. And, you know, a lot of times people... Fall, it falls to the wayside, even in the Marine Corps. You know, yeah. even in the you know the Fleet Marine Corps, it's the same thing. Like, hey, let's get our annual training done, and it's like, well, what if we actually did the training? Right. What would actually happen? Um, so, 
one of the questions I want to ask you is like, as a staff in CYC, what what was your battle rhythm, and have you changed? Does your battle rhythm change when you switch offices, or is it kind of just the same for every office you take over? Yeah, I, I think to stay the same at all times is going to be detrimental to your own personal growth. Um, so, I changed from when I first took over an office to right this moment now uh, running an office. And I think you know, a lot of that changed due to you know my experience with MEPS, uh, my experience uh, being a, being the OSA Office of Selection Assistant, um, doing those different things and having different stations that I ran, going over to Portland, uh, things they do out there in Portland slightly different than the way they do things here in Jersey mm-hmm. before, completely different from how they do things in Jersey now. How Jersey is now is completely different from how Jersey was before. Uh, so if you're not changing or adapting with the times or adapting what's going on, then you're, you're going to stay stagnant. You're going to stay behind and, and you're never going to improve. So, uh, my battle rhythm has, has kind of changed depending on the flow, the Marines that I have, the mission and the AO and what's going on. Um, one thing I've added that I didn't have added before was personal life. Uh, because before recruiting was it, that was, that was, that was, there was nothing else. Like you mentioned, like I was always in your office. I was there, there, blah, blah, all that. All that was great. However, all that came at a price. It came at a price at home was neglected. At home was was pushed aside. At home, you know, decisions were being made that shouldn't have been made because I didn't have a focus on those things. My focus was taking care of the Marines and then taking care of the mission, and that was it. And taking care of the police, you know, being there for the police, answering their calls no matter what's going on. That was always like the number one priority. Yeah. Um, so a little bit of that has changed now to where like I'm starting to say, all right, cool. Well, I need to take care of myself. I'm gonna go to the gym. Because before I got fat and nasty and I didn't work out like I used to, uh, and then sometimes uniform wouldn't fit, and a lot of times you see Marines don't want to put their uniform on because they don't look good in their uniform because they look nasty and stuff like that. Uh, so trying to get back into that Marine Corps concept of like I should be working out. There's 24 hours in a day, right? I need maybe about five, six hours of sleep, uh, and then from there the rest of the time I can work out and then I can do my job. Yeah. Um, as a staff, I see we have a lot of responsibilities, but there are a lot of things that that are timed out. So if I do them at the right time or in advance, then I'll never get behind on it mm-hmm. as long as I know exactly what it is I need to do, right? Yeah. So so I found like, you know, uh, like my morning meetings have differed, have changed, depending on who the Marine is, depends on how intense the, 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 the morning meeting is, um, to the, the daily, you know, check-ins and everything like that. Uh, sometimes there'll be times where I just, I won't bother anyone. I'll just let them go, go do their thing. Because I can remember times when I was out there, you know, as I like to call it, operating. Uh, and I'm out there, you know, doing my thing, and uh, and I'm getting a phone call. Hey, what's going on? What's this and the other? And I'm like, oh, you know, doing this that, and the other. Uh, nothing, nothing yet. And then I can remember as staff so I see asking Marines, hey, what do you got for tomorrow? What are you up to? Blah blah blah. And like nothing yet, nothing yet. So I'm like, I don't want to constantly every hour or every thirty minutes to get bad news, bro, because <laughs> it's gonna get annoying, right? Dude, yeah. So it was like, yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of I'll let it go for a little bit, and I know it's like, oh no, you need to be following for them every minute, every hour, blah blah blah. And I get that completely. But there's a time and place for that. That that I don't think that should be an everyday kind yeah. of thing. That should be depending on situation and what's going on with Situa- that marine. Yeah, situation. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you'll know during the day or in the morning time what's going on with that marine yeah. throughout the day, right? And it, so. and it's also the fact that some people that works with and some people that doesn't. Right. Like when you do that with some with some people, they're like they're shut off. Yeah. They're like, bro, I'm yeah. done. I'm done with you, man. It doesn't even matter that I have nothing. It doesn't even matter that I have attempted to get something because right. you're gonna call me when I tell you I have nothing. And I think that, and I was saying this on another episode at some point, but, you know, I found myself in that same way because I remember, you know, I had, a, you know, a boss and um, he would be like that. There would be days where, like, when the command members were in the office, mm-hmm. he'd be all over me. Yeah, yeah. But when the command members weren't in the office, he was yeah. never over me. Yeah. <laughs> and and those were the days where I would hate getting phone calls every hour on the hour. And it's like, dude, it just took me 20 minutes just to drive to this point, and you're not even, you know. Yeah. And I and I think that's the Dog and Tony show, of course. Yeah. I mean, trying to show. But things. I think it's also, but there's some people who actually operate like that right. on a on an everyday basis. Yeah. You know, and it's like you know, like there was an episode earlier um, that I had had one of my very first episodes, and it was uh, there was a Marine out in some RS somewhere in the world um, who had reached out to me, and his boss was a successful recruiter became a boss and then started making changes and mm-hmm. it was like stuff that didn't make sense right. so one of the things they did was this boss decided that he was going to completely 
close the PCS. Okay. And no Marines were going to go in that PCS because he didn't trust them. Okay. And my viewpoint was like, okay, well, I, okay, there's had to have been reasons why you didn't right, trust right, these right. Marines, hopefully, right? But then my thing was, okay, well, you just closed off an entire AL, mm-hmm. and now this entire PCS is being, now the Army or whoever's next yeah. door is taking all of these contracts, and, and sure enough, that's exactly what ended up happening. It's weird. And, and it's just like, what are some different ways to do that? Because I think that, in my opinion, if you're somebody who your only tool is micromanagement, then mm-hmm. you should probably get out of the Marine Corps. Right. Um, because, like, what are some other ways for you to to lead Marines in this capacity when, you know, maybe you don't trust them, maybe you think they are bullshitting or they're slacking yeah. off? Like, what are some different ways that you can, as a staff and CO, train those Marines, but also make sure that you're not holding their hand? Yeah. Are, I, I think it starts with buy-in. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you know, the Marines have to buy into your vision, uh, to your, as they call it in the Marine Corps, command philosophy. Um, you know, if they buy into that, they buy into to uh, to to you and what you're trying to what you're trying to do. You're not trying to sell them, right? You're not trying to convince them, but you're trying to be real. Like, check it out. This is what we're trying to accomplish. This is why we're trying to accomplish. If we accomplish this, this could be what happens. And then when that whatever goal gets accomplished, do you follow through with the rewards that you said you're going to give for that goal accomplishment? Mm-hmm. If you don't, then what's going to happen later on down the road when you try to push for another goal? No one's yeah. going to care. So try to accomplish that goal. So I try to ensure that if I make a promise to one of my Marines and say, hey, check it out, you do this for me, I'm going to do this for you, that they accomplish that, and then I do whatever it is that they said I was going to do for them. Hey, you said you wanted that day off or you wanted to bring a bounce out early. I mean, an example of that would be um, earlier today. So our Morgan, uh, one of my Marines down in South Jersey, he had a family dinner last night. He asked me, hey, Gunny, you know, can I go to his family dinner? I was like, yeah, go ahead and go to the family dinner. And then, um, you know, from there, he came in this morning. He's like, uh, you know, Gunny, but it's like 9 o'clock in the morning, and he's got like three or four things going on later afternoon time frame. So I was like, you know what, hey, go home, uh, be back here at one o'clock, and then from one o'clock to whenever you get out is when you'll be doing your job, right? You'll go get your PCs for your kids going up on deck, you sit down with your kids, you can do uh, an interview with, and probably do paperwork with after, because the kids obviously is committed, you know, and then from there, find your time, but then there's a prospect, and then make sure you have some for Monday as well, right? So having that man-to-man conversation, and saying, hey, check out, this is what I'm expecting of you, this is what I'm looking for you to do, and then them going out there and doing it, and believing that you can give them that time that you said you would goes a long way. Yeah. Closing out on a PCS, not a smart move. When I got down in South Jersey, you had two PCS, PCSs uh, that no one was operating out of. No one would go out to. Uh, maybe they'll do an appointment here and there and everything like that, but everything was done on RSS. And I can understand when a Marine is brand new, you want to keep them close so you yeah. can train them properly and everything like that. And, and I get that completely, and I agree with that. Where I differ is eventually I need to let that that butterfly fly, right? I need him to go go out there. I need him to go mess up well, how, so that he can how, learn. How far was the, is the PCS? Well, both PCSs are maybe like 15, 20 minutes okay. away. But so there's some. Far. But in this place, the, the PCS was an hour away. Yeah, I and mean, it was like, and that was the thing is like I feel like a huge part of the Marine Corps, especially again, I've only been in New Jersey, but from the conversations that I've had yeah, with yeah. people, even before I did the podcast, it's like, bro, we have a PCS we don't even use. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, why are you driving 45 minutes out of your way when you could just be staying there? Hey, do a, especially now with Zoom and Skype right. and all these things, morning meetings, bro, do what you got to do. If I have to meet with your kids, I'm going to meet with your kids. Right. But like, because for me, and I'm, and I'm pretty sure I just got this from you and, and Mass Artillas, but like every single kid that was ever, ever an appointment, I spoke to. Right. Every interview, I spoke yeah. to. Now, mind you, I'm going to be completely honest. There was this person um, who... Their idea was that, hey, you're, as a staff in COIC, and I'm not going to ask you whether you agree or disagree mm-hmm. with this, but just a blanket statement. It was just, it became this thing where, hey, you're going to validate every single appointment right. that's made in the office. Right. I personally don't agree with that because then I'm telling, I, in my opinion, I'm looking at my recruiter that I work with and I'm saying, hey, I don't believe you. I have to validate that you're not lying to me. Right. And then on top of that, it's like, for instance, I work now for a college, um, and I set my own appointments. My director doesn't call my appointments to see if they're going to show up tomorrow. Right. She just trusts that they're going to show up, and if they don't, and it becomes a pattern of conduct, okay, well, now, you know what? I am going to do that. Right, right. But when it becomes an everyday thing, then your Marines are like, and then, and here's a, well, this is a question, but, you know, you have say you have a marine and you're you're validating his appointments, right? Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, the, when you start validating his appointments, they start no showing. Mm-hmm. 
is it you or is it him? Right. Well, now you have no idea because maybe it is that part of the equation. Yeah. Maybe people are like, hey, bro, why the hell is this guy calling me to see yeah. if I just got on the phone with you? Right, right. Like, you just told me an hour ago that I was coming to meet you tomorrow at 11, and now some other dude's like, hey, are you still good for tomorrow at 11? Right, right. It's like... Yeah, so I guess the, uh, the concept behind it is to uh, validate, obviously, the appointment, right? Confirm that's coming in. Uh, not so much check on the recruiter to make sure that the appointment's coming in. Uh, as much as it's like to hype up the individual to say, hey, you're coming in tomorrow, so excited for you to come in, and kind of bring that enthusiasm to it. What it really boils down to at the end of the day is is control, right? Because nine times out of ten, a lot of the choices that we make are based around control, whether me being in control or someone else being in control. Uh, me personally, am I am I the kind of individual who likes to validate all the appointments and everything like that? No. No, if the recruiter tells me that they have an appointment, then I anticipate that it's the honest truth that it's, it's a real appointment. Because I can always call the appointment the next day and say, hey, did you have an appointment with this recruiter? And he says, no. Okay, now I got fraud. Yeah. Right? So now I eliminate the possibility of fraud uh, by validating an appointment right there on the spot. Or I prove that it is fraud right there at that point. And, right, yeah. and I say, hey, listen, this is fraud. Uh, so it's no good, right? So a couple different ways to skin the cat there. I mean, I, I validate appointments here and there. It all depended on, on the recruiter. A lot of times I'll have the Marine kind of hit me up and say, hey, can you hit up this kid? I'm talking to him. I don't know. It, it, it felt like he's going to come in, but I'm not too sure. All right, cool. I'll, I'll hit him up, just kind of, you know, check up on him and see what's going yeah. on. Secure logistics, yeah. you know, that kind of thing, right? So then that's what I call, hey, man, it's going to jump to Marines. You know, I see here you got a time to sit down with Sergeant whatever tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Uh, hey, did, did you need a ride or uh, is, is he going to pick you up? I said, oh, no, I'm good. I, I, need, I don't need a ride. I'll drive it myself. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Hey, just to make sure you said you were coming in tomorrow to talk to him about what exactly? Blah, blah, blah. All right, cool, man. Hey, listen, man, I'm excited. He's a good dude. You're going to learn a lot from him and everything like that. Yeah. If anything comes up, let us know, and we'll go from there, right? So I've done that before, and yeah. I, we're doing that now here in New Jersey and everything like that. Um, so I get the whole idea, the whole piece of validation. Again, like I said before, it comes down to control. Yeah. I want to be in control of the situation in the scenario. I... I'm comfortable with giving up control because I understand that in the grand scheme of things, things are going to work out the exact way they're mm-hmm. going to work out. A kid's going to come in because they choose to come in. Yeah. They're not going to come in because they, they choose, choose not, not to come, come in. in. No yeah. matter how good my, my selling yeah. him on the phone was. Yeah, and you'll feel that. Point. You'll yeah. feel that. You'll be like, yeah, yo, so that motherfucker's going to come in. And then he's right. like, bro. And if he doesn't come in, well, then that means it's more prospect time to find somebody yeah. else. Now. And it's so, like, you know, I, I get it. I understand the concept and I just the idea feel behind like, it. Yeah. I just feel like you come off thirsty as fuck. Yeah, I'm like, sure. I'm like sure. if like if you when you went to buy your Acura, mm-hmm. you didn't. First of all, you didn't even set up an appointment. But if you had set up an right. appointment, well, with everything being virtual, like I said, I kind of just set up an appointment okay, because you know. uh, the guy, the guy I had gotten the car from before, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I hit him up when I was on the way back from uh, Oregon. I was, hey, nobody, I'm gonna get a car. So but yeah. nobody called you to say, hey, yeah. are you, hey, Ralph, are you are you still yeah, coming? Still coming? Yeah, yeah, it's no. like to me, it's just like to I, again, I don't think that it shouldn't be done. I think there's a goal and a time and place for it to be done. Right. But when it becomes an everyday thing, the re- I'm, and I'm thinking as a recruiter. I'm not thinking as a staff manager. See, I'm thinking as a recruiter because as a recruiter, the recruiter man is like, bro, does this guy just not trust me? Yeah. And then it's just like, and then if you have a downward spiral of all of a sudden you have all of these no-shows, it's like, okay, well, maybe it is, you know, not talking about an 8412, but maybe the staff in CUSC who's calling to make to make the validation isn't really good at doing it. Right, yeah. You know that, I mean? That's also possible. And then that's he gets unsold. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and I feel, like, I feel like this is just a part of... Because, like, honestly, you know, I've had a boss, and I've talked to you about mm-hmm. this, where me and Romaine, we talked about it on the episode me and him did, bro. There there came a point where I literally told my staff in COSC, don't talk to my kids. Yeah. Like, don't do it, because yeah. we would sell these kids hard body, mm-hmm. we would get them, you know, or not sell, but we would do our job, and we would get them motivated and all this stuff, and then this dude would walk on the office, and it was like, we didn't Ooh, do anything, yeah, and yeah. it was just like, bro, like, I remember this one time, um, I never forget it, dude, so, tw- actually two times, two different 8412, okay. um, so one, the first one, it was me, I was the recruiter, and, um, Doing this interview with this dude, dude's killing it. Kids like, yeah, I want to, I, I want, to go, like, I want to join, da, da, da. like kneecap to kneecap, like really good interview, right? And then like half hour into the interview, this eighty four twelve walks in, in PT gear, mm-hmm. and just sits down in front of him, and he's like, hey, what's going on, big dog? And he just hot, like literally, I'm sitting here, he sits right there, just takes over the whole interview like yeah. a freight train, just. Poof. Yeah. And then he, 20, 30 minutes go by, doesn't even let the kid speak. 
doesn't let the kid speak. Just keeps going at him, going at him, showing him the macabre, showing him all this cool stuff. And I'm just like, dude, the kid doesn't want any of that, but whatever. So he's like, so you ready to do this? Kid commits to him. And I'm like, I'm in my head, I'm like, bro, I know how this is about to play out. So the kid commits to him. And um, he's like, all right, so this is what Sergeant Bennett's going to do with you. Blase, blase. And then he's like, all right, Sergeant Bennett, get in the car and bring him home. I'm like, bro, I know how to do my job. Like, yeah. boy, okay, I guess you're going to tell me this now. So I get in the car with the dude. I start talking to him. And again, I'm, I'm making sure everything we talked about is we brought up. Hey, man, how are we going to talk about mom? We did a whole replay. Like, yeah, yeah. We did a whole entire freaking role play about, hey, man, I'm mom. You're you. Yeah, yeah. Bro, we walk in the house. And kids like I'm like, hey man, she's like, she invites me in the house. We're sitting in the kitchen. We're at the the freaking little island, and um, and I'm like, so I'm um, gonna tell her, and he goes, tell her what? And I'm like, bro, I'm like, bro, you, we just talked about this. Like we just had like a three hour conversation. Yeah. Like, and I'm like, and she goes, well, what are you gonna tell me, Johnny? And that was <laughs> literally Johnny. Yeah. And uh, he goes. Nah, nah, I don't really have anything to say. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, this didn't happen. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. this is not happening right now, yeah. man. And his mom's like, so what did he have to say? And I was like, well, you know, three and a half hours ago, like we've been talking about him becoming a Marine. She goes, no, 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 that's not going to happen. We're going to actually have to talk about this, this, and the third. And long story short, we go out to the car, and um, I go back, head out, and Dad comes up to me, and he's like, listen, man, Dad was from Ireland, and Dad's just like, you know, thick accent, and his dad straight out was like, listen, I'm all for it. He's like, but it just seems like my son's not. And he's like, I don't know what happened. He's like, maybe mom made him nervous, but he was like, you know, I'm going to talk to him about it. He's like, I would love for him to join, but, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to push him, but if he comes back, he comes back. Right. I was like, sir, that's all I want. I was like, and I apologize, because we literally just had this conversation in the car before we pulled up. I don't know what happened. So, whatever. So I get in the car. I'm in the car. I'm bogging out. The staff and supervisor so called yeah. me. Yo, did you get PCs? I'm like, no. He's like, what do you mean? We had him for you. I'm like, no, 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 no. You didn't. You never had him. Yeah. You hijacked him. You bullied him into saying yes. Yeah. And then you put him in the car with me to go get PCs. But we never even, we never finished the interview. You yeah. just bullied. You just hijacked this shit. So, the next day, we go to call and the boss goes to call in numbers and the 8412 is sitting in the ops chief seat and he's like. Why don't I have John so and so as an NWA? And um and he's like, Oh, so you freaking lost it. He's like, I gave you a goddamn contract. I'm like, No, that's not what happened, bro. Yeah. And the, the, the now it was my fault. Right. And I'm like, bro. Then there was this other time with another eighty four twelve. And he walks in the office, this time on the staff in CUSC. Okay. And my recruiter comes up to me and he goes, Staff Sergeant. He goes, Please don't let him talk to my kid. He's like, I'm telling you right now, I have a great feeling about this kid, but this kid, if he talks to my kid, I'm going to lose him. So I literally go up to the gunny, and I'm like, gunny, gunny, gunny. I'm, and I'm boys with this yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, gunny, can you do me a favor? He's like, what, Bennett? I'm like, can you just not talk to this kid? He's like, what do you mean? He's like, what, you think I'm going to have a full-on conversation with this kid, hijack the interview? He goes, I'm not that guy. He knew yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, I'm not that guy. So I'm just like, I'm like, Gunny, can you just not? I was like, can you just maybe do an IOF, do, or not an IOF, but yeah. Yeah. yeah I was yeah, like, can you just do an, you know, do an IOF on him from the backside? Like, yeah, don't yeah, pop, yeah. Just, just leave him alone. I was like, he doesn't need your help. Just please. Dude, first benefit tag. Dude runs in. Wow. So, bro, I'm like, dude. And literally, my recruiter comes into my office, closes the door. He's like, hey, man, I'm gonna, I'll be right back. I'm going to get some water. So my recruiter comes into my office, Morales, and he's like, bro, I'm like, dude, I told him not to. Yeah. And he's just like, bro, he's gone. He's gone. Literally, this recruiter had uncovered all of these things in the first tag. Mm -hmm. And then the 8412 hijacked the rest of the entire interview. Yeah. Didn't talk about anything that this recruiter had uncovered in the first tag. And then bullied the kid into saying yes. Mm -hmm. Bullied the kid into going home to get docs. The kid never came back. Of course. And he's like, yo, what happened to the kid? I'm like, bro, what do you mean? Like, yeah. And it's like, it's just like, bro, like, my, my thing is, is that I feel like a lot of it is that, like, I don't know where I was going with it, with either of those two stories. No. I, <laughs> but I, 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 see I feel on. like, I feel like a lot of it is just, we we get to a point as a staff at CYC, I can't say as an 8412 because I'm not one. But I feel like we get to a point where it's like, hey, I know what the fuck I'm doing and you need to listen to me. 
And yeah. it's like, but dude, he so does he. He's been on the streets for a year. Right. He knows his kids that he talks to. He knows where to go at point two and three. Right. And if he doesn't ask for your help, then why are you jumping in the conversation? Because, especially because you got to think about it too, and again, this is my opinion, but he's never going to meet Ralph Ujama again. Right. Unless you're the staff in CYC, yeah. he's never going to meet yeah. you again. So why did you just come into his life and interrupt it? Right. Because him and that recruiter, they met on the street or the mm. phone. They already built rapport. They already have a relationship going on. So why did you just feel the need to hop in? Now, mind you, if I'm doing an interview and I'm like, oh, hey, man, this is Gunnery Sergeant so-and-so. Right. Hey, do you mind talking about how this guy? I know yeah. you had it. That's a different story because right. I invited you into the conversation. Exactly. But then at some point, you got to get the fuck out of the conversation because right. you don't have any place being here. 100%. You know what I mean? So, so that, that comes down to fear. Mm-hmm. Control. Yeah. Right? Control Control is going to be the common theme that you're going to find uh, that I learned that all encompasses. I'm going to close down a PCS because it's in our way. Fear. Control. Right? I want to have the control here at the RSS. I'm afraid of what people are going to do when I'm not there and I don't want to drive over there because it's an hour away. Right? Mm-hmm. Now it's a comfort based decision as well. Now you have that the situation to where I'm eighty four twelve, so I know everything and everything. I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna take your kid, and I'm gonna freaking do a thing. But the one thing that we probably missed throughout that entire thing was the one thing that's ongoing in every conversation, right? That's building rapport, right? So building rapport was never done. So I'm gonna jump in, I'm gonna hijack your interview, but I never built a rapport with the kid for them to be trustworthy of me to be able to be open with me and actually be honest with me, right? So I agree for me and and um the way I always do when it comes to interviews, I don't hijack an interview no matter how bad the interview is going. Uh, you're going to crash or fail, you're going to crash or fail. I'll help you after it's done, and I'll figure out how to salvage it after it's done, right? But I'm not going to hijack your interview as you're in the middle of the interview because there's certain things that have happened in that conversation prior to that I don't know about, mm-hmm. right? So the way I do it is I just say, hey, if you want to tag me into your interview, just let me, like, call, call me out. It's like, hey, Gunny John, you mentioned blah, blah, blah. Can you talk to Johnny, blah, blah, blah? Yeah, sure thing. Hey, Johnny, yeah, man. So blah, 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 blah. I'll do my thing. Like, All right, cool. You got any questions? All right, listen, while I'm right over here, man, if you guys have any, any other questions, let me know. And then, boom, I freaking, I, I exit stage right, right? Mm-hmm. That's always the way I've done it because, for me, that's how Matt Sar- Rodriguez did it as well. He would come in. He'd be there. I'd look back at him. It's like a uh, staff sergeant. And then he'd freaking come in, jump in, say his thing. Boom, he'd freaking bounce. Just like that. So I was like, all right, cool. That's just the way I knew I had how to do it. And that's the only way for me it made sense. Again, like I said, I'm I'm not gonna hijack someone's interview because it's I don't care about the control. Mm-hmm. Because I'm confident in my abilities afterwards, mm-hmm. after everything's said and done, to really kind of figure out what's going on. And then you had mentioned earlier, you know, about um I can't remember exactly what the, the word that you used was, but uh like a salesman, right? Like car yeah. salesman, like like you're freaking out, uh, like uh, oh I'm sorry, like bullying. It's like bullying, yeah, yeah. bullying the kid yeah. to commit. I don't want to bully a kid to commit because I don't want to seem desperate, right? Mm-hmm. I don't want to seem like I need you. Yeah. I don't need you to join the Marine Corps. Yeah, yeah. I want you to join if that's what you want. Yeah. If you don't want that, then that's that's you. We'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. You'll come back later on down the road when you realize that everything I was saying to you was actually a freaking good idea for you and it was gonna help you become successful. Yeah. But that's on you to figure out. That's on you to to kind of go through that hard life of pain and everything like that, right? So. For me, that's what helped me be successful because then when I was a recruiter and I had an interview with the kid, I wouldn't just, all right, cool, he's done with. I'd follow up with the kid. Hey, yeah. man, what's going on? Did you actually get that job that you said you were going to try to get? Or did you actually go here? Did you do this, that, and the other? Whatever it is that they sp- sat down and spoke to me and said, this is the reason why I can't do this right now. I was like, all right, cool, go ahead, go figure that out. Yeah. When that fails, that's fine. But I knew I was still going to write my contract for that month because I had someone month from the month prior yeah. who I had interviewed who was like, hey, I just need some time to think about it. All right, cool. I followed him, stayed in contact with him, and then boom, now they're freaking ready to do it, and now I got them back. I can't name you. I, mean, I have so many kids that I had spoken to once, and then they came back later on down the road, yeah. right? Because I knew it was the long-term game. Yeah. yeah, I know I need the contract in month, yeah, but yeah. that in contract in month was from the previous month interview. That's yeah. why interviews are so important, right? Yeah. So, so I yeah. think that's a huge part that people forget is the follow-up. Huge. Like, even huge. with my new job, dude, even yeah. with my new job, bro. Yeah. I have so many people that I've gotten to enroll yeah. just off of a follow-up that I didn't even, I never made the first phone call. Right. And I just hit people up, and I'm like, and I'll see it in the, like, the way our system works is it's like 10,000 pounds better than Chris, but it, um, you pull up the lead card, you click the phone number, it's a hyperlink, okay. and then you text it from their lead card page. Okay. And then the, the text never go away. So I'll just look up real quick, and it'll be like, Ralph, you know, Ralph, and it'll say like, oh, do you want information? And then Ralph said yes. Okay. 
but then no one called him. Right. No right. one called him and hit him up. So now I'm just looking for those, and I'm hitting yeah. them up. Like, hey, listen, man, I, I see that you. no one ever called you. What happened? He's like, I don't know. I'm, I'm really interested. And this is like three, four months ago. <laughs> and I'm like, well, hey, man, we actually have a class starting tomorrow, or I'll be like next week or whatever. And then I get the kid to join, you know, enroll. And literally my boss and the top salesman came up to me, and they were like, bro, your follow-up is sick. Yeah, and I was just like, well, "Why isn't yours?" Yeah, like, I know, right? Or like, these are all have a good ones. Yeah, like, yeah, me. yeah like, I'm good, like, man. Because like, like, literally, I don't do any of the yeah. work. I'm just following up people you never followed up with. Right. Like there was this one girl that um, she kept like, she'd be like, "Oh, I'm interested," and then she'd fall off, and then, "Oh, I'm interested." So I literally followed up with her like since I started in May up until now. And my boss, one of the one of the other supervisors, was like, "Why do you keep doing that?" And I'm like, "Well, she keeps saying she's interested." But clearly, there's other things going on that's stopping her from being. Right. And I'm like, and she keeps hitting me up. So I was like, what's a two minute phone call for yeah, me to just exactly. be like, hey, how are you? Because yeah. eventually, maybe she is going to do it. Right. And you know, and that's the thing is, I think the art of the follow up is just lost with everybody, it and is. even even especially in on recruiting duty. Yeah. Because how many con? Like, I don't know how, and I've been I've been victim to it. Mm-hmm. You know, because I don't know how many times like there'd be a kid that I could, I forgot to hit back up, and then Durkey would come in with him, and I'd be like. I Yo, mean, I know that kid, and he'd yeah. be like, like, dude, McCann, Robbie okay. McCann, he is a kid that I AC'd, got his pack card, put it in my pocket, it was me and Arana, I AC'd him, and then a year later, Romaine brings him in the office, Pete, like, ready to sign, now he's in the Marine Corps, he's a corporal, yeah. and he literally came up to me, he was like, bro, you should have been my recruiter, yeah. he's like, you met me, you talked to me, you talked yeah. about the Marine Corps, and you never called me back, yeah. bro, and I was like... I can't imagine how many people I've just never called. It happens that. all the time. Yeah, it happens all the time, and that's that's one of the things that that uh, once a, a marine figures out on recruiting duty, that's when they hit that next level. So mm-hmm. like you know, we all know this, right? You're well, we you know for the most part, uh, the first year is just you hustling. Yeah, that's you trying to talk to every single person. And that's you talk the to, problem. Right? People but don't want to do that. that. Nobody yeah, wants nobody to wants fucking to do, that. do that, bro. But then now you get that nobody kid, right? Wants now to you do follow that. up with them. And the thing and is, like, it goes back a year later. And that's the thing is, people tell you that shit in BRC. They're like, bro, the first year, and everyone's like, yeah, bro, I don't want to work that long. It's like, bro, but if you do, yeah. if you really it do, pays, pays everything off. It off. really does. Your second, mm-hmm. your third year, you're not doing shit. You got yeah. people bringing kids in because you met those sophomores and those juniors, and then those kids who became grads who their plan didn't work out, and then they're just coming back to you exactly while you're, you know, and you're getting in month contracts well they're, well they're now you're in month right. and then you get this bag right. which you know some people never get to have um, but I think that a lot of it is just that yeah, um, so here's a here's a question for you I don't know if you've ever dealt with this but um, so there's a a, fr- um, a guy that I've been going back and forth with uh, he's an 8411 staff at CIC I don't know where but he essentially right now what's going on with him is he just became a staff in CIC. He's like a month, like four or five in. And two of his, one of his recruiters now has to see um, mental health. Okay. So now every day, it's like two or three times a week. And then he has a recruiter who um, who didn't not didn't get a DUI, but got in trouble for out, like is seeking counseling for alcoholism. Okay. So he has two of his recruiters down. They have all of, but now they're still in the fight. They're still working with him. How do you, run an office effectively with things like that going on. Yeah, well you don't. You don't you can't run an office effectively like that. I mean mm-hmm. again if you're looking for effective then then the answer is no, you're not going to be able to run it effective because you're down the manpower that's needed, right? Um that's like how do you throw out a baseball team if you only have five players on the team? Well there's three other positions that can't be fielded. So is your team gonna be effective? No. Every other five the five other players would be all the greatest players in baseball. Mm-hmm. But you still have three spots on the field that need to be filled. Right? So you're never gonna have you're never gonna be the most effective team that you can be. Now what you're gonna try to do or what you can try to do is make the most of what you have, right? Yeah. Because that's what Marines have done all throughout yeah. time. We whatever shitty situation we've been thrown into, we adapt and overcome within that situation. Mm-hmm. So uh, still would his goal or should his goal be to accomplish the mission? Absolutely, there's no question about that. Is he gonna have a lot of things going against him to accomplish that mission? Yeah, for sure. Two gap sectors, you know, for the most part, are slightly yeah. gap sectors, right? If the guys are in the office or out of the office, stuff like that. The biggest thing for him to do is take his Marines that he has in the fight and then work those Marines effectively. Not overwork them. That's what work I was going to ask you. It's because I feel yeah. like that happens is people think, like, oh, we're killing it, we're killing it. But then you never let your foot off the gas. You never relax. You never give them the time they need. And right. then they get overworked. And then they're like, bro, where's the end of the tunnel? You see, that, that control is what the individual has that Staff C has for them, right? So they can control, hey, listen, 
tomorrow, hey, come in tomorrow at 9.30, t- come in tomorrow at 10 o'clock, right? I can control that and still have the Marine work throughout the day. Or as I see that Marine working throughout the day and he has an appointment for the next day, hey, man, what else you got going on today? You got this, that, and the other? All right, do this, man. Freaking close it all yourself. Make sure everything's good. And then go to bounce out. All right, see you tomorrow. Like, you, as a savage, I see you control that, mm-hmm. right? And if you control it in a positive way, not a negative way, as far as you can make fear-based decisions, or you're going to stay here all night long so you freaking find yourself in tomorrow. That's, that's awesome, right? I mean, we've all been there, right? We've all had the AC at freaking 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night, 1 o'clock in the morning. And, and yeah, it's great. Maybe every now and then you actually find a kid and, and it actually does work out. I don't remember any freaking single kid that has ever been found at that time that actually committed and actually joined the Marine Corps. I can't remember when. Maybe someone has one that's fucking great for them, but I've never seen one happen, right? So what that becomes is just a punishment for you not doing your job. So now we look at, all right, why didn't they do their job between, you know, say, 9, really 10 o'clock, right? Uh, 10 o'clock and 6 o'clock, right? Nine, from, from 10 to 6, why didn't you do your job between that time frame? Well, that becomes an individual-based decision. Well, mm-hmm. why didn't I, as the recruiter, do what I need to do throughout that time frame? Or did I make the attempts, did I have the effort, and things just didn't pan out? Well, shit, it's recruiting duty. It's not going to work every single day. Yeah. So there has to be an understanding that it's not going to work every single day, but there's an effort, mm-hmm. right? If I'm working towards hitting my prospecting objectives, right? If I hit maybe 2% of my prospecting objectives and I have nothing for tomorrow, well, then you can't really say shit to me, right? Because you didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. But if you hit 80% of your prospecting objectives, you don't have anything for tomorrow, well, okay, I've been in contact with you throughout the day, so I know what's going on with your situation. And then I'm looking at some point to where, where can I intercede to kind of help you out and assist you? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I would know if I'm the staff, so I see what's going on with you. And I could then speak to it, or I could brief to it, or I could protect you, or really I could just freaking slam the hammer on you. Yeah. But I would know what's going on, mm. right? So what the, the best advice I have to give to that, to that guy is, is this is going to be that time frame to where your programs need to be the catalyst of your RSS. Because you're not going to have the recruiting pile, which... Only forty percent should be coming from recruiters anyway. Yeah. Sixty should come from programs. Yeah. So if your pool program is weak and it's not effective, well then that's a problem. If your freaking high school college program is freaking weak and not effective, that's another freaking problem, right? Your CDR program, if that's not working for you, that's a problem. If you have a local reserve station, then you'd be talking to those guys, get those EEDers back out here, because that's free freaking candy right there, right? Mm-hmm. That's an EED that you could have that's in the office that's gonna that be supplemented for you. And it's kind of, exactly. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with anything else. So now you have extra bodies in the office to assist you. Now, again, if you don't have that, yeah. I get that. That becomes a little well, more I, difficult because you don't have those kinds of yeah. things. Yeah, and I also think it makes sense like if you're going to have an EAD or to use them as an EAD or right. like me. Yeah. I was on numbers the yeah. whole time I right. was an EAD or right. one, which you're not supposed to be. Right. Well, you're not on production, but, but you're I, on production. But you're not supposed to yeah, be Yeah, but, but, you're, but you're on production. Yes. Right? So it, it's not a matter of like you're not supposed to be in production mm-hmm. as opposed to like – you're, you're not all production, but you still get numbers. Yeah, but you're not. What I'm saying is is that, like, all right, so when Mammoth was a one in five, yeah. right, I was a fifth. I was a recruiter. Right. Realistically, Mammoth was a one in f- was a, it was a one in five, but only four recruiters. Correct. Because an EAD does, the EAD does not count yeah, as manpower. Right. Yep. So, I, but I was being treated as if I was manpower. Uh, and I then the you. office, yeah. was they were never seen as down a sector. Right, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they should have been given... They should have been given a Marine to, you know, to, yeah, to compensate for that's that That's what area. I'm saying. Yeah. Like, people yeah. use these EADers, and in my opinion, just not the right way. Right. Well, I mean, I, I think I think having EADers out here is a positive. No, yeah, and, 100%. You know, and and, and because where, where you, the benefits is when you have an EADer who wants to be successful and then maybe perhaps wants to become an 8412, yeah. then you need to put that individual on some sort of production standard yeah. because that's the only way to get them to that next yeah. point. I think, didn't we have a kid named uh, Bell before? Yeah, yeah. We had Bell. Like, Bell yeah, yeah. was never going to become an 8412. But he did what he needed to do. Yeah, I yeah. mean, we had, a, as a recreator, we had a, a Rodriguez. Yeah. You know, uh, Rodriguez was a, was a record for us. He's he's never going to become an 8412 and, and stay out here and, and become a, an EAD recruiter. Yeah. Right? We, we get that. But still, you know, the guys like you, uh, Sergeant Jack and down south for me in South Jersey, you know, and there's a bunch of other EADers all across New Jersey now, so yeah. many more than I've ever seen in New Jersey. Uh, that's a huge untapped market that yeah. we have that we should be using because that's an extra body in the RSS. Yeah. We but that's what, I, but that's what I'm saying. It should be used appropriately and right. Because right. you, ha- in my opinion, if you have an EAD, that EAD should just be there to help everybody in the office. Okay. Because then he's taking the workload off of you, off of you, off of you, and especially if you have a one in five where he's just an extra recruiter, then he really should just be there 
as just another person to help guide you because now he's been through BRC. He knows I, what he's I, doing. I see what you're saying. I, I think the difficulty would be is what sector do they run, right? What sector does he have? Mm-hmm. Does he have RSS Mama? That mm-hmm. means he can go anywhere. So that means now you're taking food away from another recruiter. Because now you're in my AO, seeing my contracts. Where's your AO? No, he's just right? with everybody. Exactly. So, and that's a good concept. But at the end of the day, if we were walking around my mall, yeah. we're walking around my school, and yeah. you're getting appointed for my school, and I got nothing for tomorrow, I'm going to start to build. Well, I'm not on fun. production. They're yours. Well, I, I got you, but you still need to write because if you don't write, you're not producing, then you could be kicked off EAD program as well. Mm. So, so then how do we have the EAD year to be held accountable to what they need to provide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the EAD year could just be like, oh, I'm good, I'm out. Right? Because yeah. you could do that as well. Like, hey, I'm good, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah. Or the command could be like, eh, you know what? You're not producing, you're not bringing anything to the table, so, you know, goodbye, you're yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Right? So it's, 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 a, it's an awesome program, and it has it ha- its faults. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have its faults. There's nothing that's there's nothing perfect. Yeah. It has its faults. So how do, we, how do we try to eliminate as many of those faults as we can? Yeah. We give you a sector. So like that, you can't say, well, I've been set up for failure. Well, yeah. I didn't have my own sector. I didn't have my own schools. How am I supposed to write contracts? He has schools. He has a sector. He has, he has this many people that he could talk to. What do I have? Well, you have the entire RSS. Yeah, but I mean, that, that's not the same thing. Yeah. So so at that point in time, now we take away the, the ability for you to be like, well, I'm not being set up for success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because now you have a sector. Yeah. So, so that, that's that how it was for me part. when I first got right. out there. I had no sector and I right. was just like going everywhere. That, that was the thing for me when yeah. I came out here, uh, uh, when I came out the first time in Middlesex, Middlesex was one of five and there was five Marines and I came out here with my buddy Winchuck. We were both in BRC together, basic recruiting school, right? Uh, so we're all, we both came out to Middlesex, but he checked in like maybe a couple of days before me or a week before me and he took one of the sectors already. I got there. I had a uh, staff sergeant Shabar who just recently retired uh, from the Marine Corps. He had his sector. And I shadowed him, mm-hmm. and then I would just I would just TC off every list. So yeah. I had my first senior or my, my first contract from South Amboy, but South Amboy wasn't my L. But they gave me an old list and say, "Hey, call this old list." And sure enough, I set up one from an old ass list. Yeah, yeah. I was amazing. That's yeah, a good yeah. point. So so you know I, I have these contracts from South Amboy, but yet I became the recruiter for the Brunswick area. Yeah. Right. So two completely different areas. <clears throat> was it difficult? Yeah, it was because I didn't have a school, but I was fortunate that I didn't remain. Uh, um, ungapped recruiter for a long period of time. I think maybe it was maybe two, three weeks, maybe a month, if that. Yeah. And basically, all I did was I'd go around with all the recruiters. That's where me and Staff Sergeant Williams we got so close because oh, I'd roll with him. Gotcha. You know, so then I'd roll with him, or I'd roll with uh, Gonzalez. You know, at the time, um, or I'd roll with uh, Chamorro. Chamorro I rolled with a lot because he was gonna be the one I was gonna replace. So, so again, you know, like all the di- all the all the the, the sectors and, and being gapped and everything like that. You need you need to have your own piece of land, right? You yeah. need to have something that you can take ownership in. Because if you can't take ownership in it, then now you have the excuse of, well, I've got nothing. Yeah. What are you going to hold me to? That's true, yeah. So so I think now, again, that's between the staff, so I see, yeah. and that Marine to have those conversations and kind of get those things figured out. Yeah. Hey, man, you got all the non-working schools. Okay, cool. So now I know as the, the EAD are in the office, as the sixth man in the one and five, I have all the non-working schools. So that's my sector. My sector are all the non-work schools. I can then go in McCris. I can change everything to their name. Now they have the ability to freaking work their non-working schools. Mm-hmm. Still gonna be a small percentage of what the everyone else has, but at least it's something, right? It's yeah, something yeah. you can find, you can take ownership in and say, all right, cool, I'm working this, I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that becomes the uh, the big conversation. And like I said before, the buy-in yeah, to yeah, have yeah. with that Marine of, and check it out, this is what's going on. Because this is a situation I'm gonna be running here real soon with Sergeant Jack Meta. Um, and I have two brand new Marines that are going to be coming into RSS South Jersey. Yeah, yeah. And Sergeant Jackson is the ADR. Yeah. So clearly that Marine is going to be taking that sector because he's an ADR. Yeah. So he asked me, he's like, well, Gunny, what am I going to do? I was like, listen, I'll figure that out when we get to that point. For now, you keep doing what you're doing right now. I'm going to take care of you when we get to that point. Just trust me. Yeah, and yeah. I built enough rapport with him that he can trust me and say, God, Gunny, I trust that you're not going to screw me over. You're going to take care of yeah. me, right? So now I have to figure that out, which it's going to get figured out. It, it's a, it's a later on problem, yeah, right? Yeah, it's yeah. not a problem that I need to deal with right now. It's not yeah. the closest fire that I need to put out, right? Yeah. So it's a fire that I see the miles away. All right, cool. There's going to be an issue coming down. Yeah, yeah. But what's going on right now? Well, right now is mission, right? I need yeah. to figure that part out. I need to make sure that Marines are going to the schools and doing everything they need to do, blah, 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 all that stuff, right? So that's my biggest priority. That's my biggest concern. That's why I tell him, hey, this is what's most important to me right now and why. When we get to that point, it's more likely to be ironed out. You're probably gonna get pulled away and be a staff so I see somewhere. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So so it might not even be a problem that we even have to deal with. Why yeah. bother? Why why, why give ourselves anxiety about yeah, it yeah. now? You know? 
Uh, right. So, so I, I think that's uh, that's one of the things. Like you know, again, talking about your, your the, the guy that you're talking about who's got all these issues in his office, uh, he's gonna drive himself crazy trying to overthink certain problems. Yeah. If he just keeps it simple, go to your programs and make your programs as most effective as you can. Create incentives for your police to provide referrals. Create incentives for your reservists to want to come in and provide referrals, or for your reservists to want to go in on rec aid or go in and become an EAD or stuff like that. Get those extra bodies in. Give them the reward that you said you're going to give them. And then uh, from there, allow it to bloom, allow it to blossom. You have to be patient, though. And that's the part that sucks about recruitment because there's no patient on recruitment because we have a mission we have to meet every single month, and it doesn't go away. Yeah. So I can have two appointments tomorrow, but what do I have for freaking for, for Wednesday? Yeah. Nothing. All right, well, what do I have for contracts this month? Well, I got two. Okay, cool. Well, what do you got for next week anyway? You know yeah. what I'm saying? So it's like it's a never-ending thing. Never so ending how do you pace yourself within there? You have to be patient. And patience is something I learned recently, not something that I had from the very beginning. Because yeah. I wasn't a patient individual at the beginning. I was a, hey, man, where's my shit? What the hell's going on? I was that kind of person. And then as I continued on, I realized I have to become patient. And now I'm at the point now where I'm patient. I listen, I get it. It's going to be ebbs and flows. But that's going to come with time. So yeah. as an 84, uh, 8411 who's in a station with all these issues, the best advice I give him is to be patient, to focus on what's important, is Taking care of the foolies, shipping those kids out, and finding more kids to join the Marine Corps, and then everything else will work its way out, you know. Uh, but uh, that, that's the best advice I can give for that. Here's another question for you. You're in an RSS. Yeah. You're in an office. Um, your sector, and this is something that I ran into, and I never figured out what to do. Okay. Okay. So you're in an, and you're in an, you're in a sector that predominantly historically TCs don't do dog shit for okay. you. TCs do nothing. You'll make 200 phone calls a day. You'll get barely any contact. And if you do, kids disqualify. So you sit in the office and you make 150 TCs. Like, no lie. You sit there, you grind them out, and you make them. You get nothing. Tomorrow you do the same thing. Tomorrow you do the same thing. But your command is on top of you about numbers, right? right? right. But you're just like, but gunny, but mass arm, but master guns. Yeah. Phone calls aren't doing anything yeah, for you. me. But hey, man, I need you to make my TC objective. Right. But at the same point, it's like, okay, making this objective, if you look at my my 90 days of data, I don't even get contract. It's not because I'm not good at TCs. Because if I call his list, if I call that sector, I'll get contact, I'll right. get appointments, I'll get grads. But if I call my sector, I will not. The question is, why continue to make a number when the number is doing nothing for you? Yeah. Um, because I feel like a lot of people get so caught up in the number I agree with that, that it's, 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 an, it's, well, hey, like, and, and it's also the fact of you, you know, if I sit in the office, and I've been there as a recruiter, if I sit in the office all day long, I, and I make 200 phone calls, because you can. Don't tell me you can't. You can make two to 300 phone calls. You've seen it done. Oh, yeah, I've done I'm it. not saying you, but people listen and yeah. go, like, you can't do that. No, the fuck you can. Um, but if I sit in the office and I make 150 or 200 phone calls, I have time shown in McCris. But if I go out in the streets and I don't find any kind of AC contact for six hours, the staff and COI sees and be like, bro, what the hell were you doing for six hours? There's yeah. no, there's no, the, there's no, it was dry. Right. Yeah, bullshit. Yeah, yeah. I hate so the, it's I hate like, the, it was a ghost town. Or the, yeah, no, I, I would yeah. hate, I would hate to hear that. So um, my question is, like, what do you do? That seems Because, so, like, because, like, Old Bridge. Yeah. Old Bridge is that AO. Yeah, yeah. You can make, like, I don't know how, you know, Smith is now, but, like, Morales. Bro, Morales would make Quavos. They would make two, three hundred phone calls to the same list, and they would get nowhere. Yeah. And it's like, well, why are we going to continue to destroy these lists and make phone calls that have never, it's been six months and we still haven't gotten anything? Right. Like, what's the... Yeah, no, so you're not, you're not wrong. So this is what I walked into when I got to South Jersey. When I got South Jersey, they were making a shit ton of CCs. Uh, they weren't really getting much out of it. Um, and we have to remember, we're also dealing with the Marines who, well, a lot of them obviously weren't even around here, you know, back then. But yeah. during COVID time frame, yeah. TCs was the only way the to really do anything, do, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so no one knew how to AC. So it became more of a, a comfort based decision, right? Mm. Because we could control the fact that I pick up the phone and I make phone calls. So I'm too afraid to go out there and talk to people in the streets. Oh, so remember, control fear, right? This is gonna be a common yeah. theme that we're talking about here, especially when we talk about leadership, uh, and especially when we talk about recruiting duty. So that's what it comes down to. I can control the fact that I'm on the phone. So again, a perfect example of this would be Sergeant Smith. 
Sarah Smith, because I was just in Monmouth for, for six weeks. So Sarah Smith was exactly that. He just picked the phone, 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 and he just, oh, that's all he'll do. And he'll make easy, you know, 150, uh, 200 freaking TCs, but he get nothing out of it. So it was like, why? Why are you, why are you on the phone? And actually, Romaine, Romaine says, you're hiding behind the phones. When Romaine came into the office, he sat down with him, and it's like, yeah, you're hiding behind the phones. You need to get out there and get your AO. But then he goes out to his AO, and he comes out with no AC contacts. Yeah. So now, it comes down to one of two things, right? It comes down to either A, there's literally nobody out there, or B, you're choosing not to talk to anybody. So now it becomes, all right, cool, well, let's get back to the definition of what an AC contact is. What is an AC contact? A name and a number. Yeah, yeah. Or the ability to contact an individual, right? Yeah. So if I can contact this individual later on the road, he's an AC contact. Does it say anywhere in there about them being qualified or disqualified? Mm-hmm. No, nothing in there. AC contact, right? Yeah, yeah. Name and follow up information. Mm-hmm. So then go get me names and follow up information. Go get me AC contacts. Because what they're doing, and I don't know, because I can't tell you what Star Smith is thinking in his head, yeah, yeah. what he's doing specifically. But what I believe Marines are doing nine times out of ten when it comes to AC is they see somebody, they're too afraid to go talk to them, so they say, ah, they're probably disqualified, and then they continue going, right? Because it's much easier to say, oh, they're probably disqualified yeah. than they're going on with them. So then I say, no, no, you're going to talk to everybody out there. Yeah. You see grandma, you talk to grandma. You see a guy yeah. in the wheelchair, you talk to a guy in the yeah, wheelchair. Yeah, yeah. You talk to every single yeah. person you see. Because they may not be qualified to join, but they, but they may have someone there. who might, bro, right? So talking about that, so... um. I was going, when I first got on recruiting duty, um, this was like right after you left. I just gotten back from BRC, and um, it was the summertime, and I met this dude at church who was a, um, who I had no idea this dude was a Marine. I had okay. no clue. He never brought it up, never talked about it, nothing. And um, all of a sudden, we were like, I don't remember how, but it came up that he was a Marine. He had just gotten out, and now he was a realtor. And he found out that I was on recruiting duty, and he was like, my, he was like, hey man, if you ever need any help, just let me know. He was like, I was really good on recruiting duty. He didn't tell me like that he was actually phenomenal on recruiting okay. duty. He was like, I was really good. He's like, but if you ever need any help, let me know, man. So long story short, he ended up coming out. He was living in uh, in Elizabeth. Okay. He ended up meeting me out at Monmouth, um, at the Monmouth Mall. And um, this is like six months into me being on recruiting. No, it's like a month into me being on recruiting duty. And um, I'm, we're walking through the mall, we're walking through the mall, and he's just like, I'm like, so are you going to help me? He's like, oh, I am. He's like, I'm helping you right now. And I was like, oh, okay. We just keep walking through the mall and walking through the mall. And like finally a half hour goes by. And he's like, are you going to talk to anybody? Yeah. He goes, bro, I've counted. And he's like, bro, I've counted at least 12 to 15 people that maybe they're not qualified. But like you could have easily had a full-on conversation with them, gotten an AC comm. And I'm like, and he's just like, let's continue. So he's like, talk to the next person you see. I don't give a damn what they look like, yeah. who they are. And it ended up being like some drug addict. And long, and he was, so, but he, what he did was he went over to the person. He was like, hey, what's going on, man? He was like, this is my friend, Doug. And Doug, this is, what's your name? And he just just brought this conversation together. Yeah. And I was like, bro, what the heck is going on yeah, right yeah. now? And then he continued to do that. And then we started, I was talking more, I was talking more. And then I was doing it. And then he, we ended up having like a 45 minute conversation with somebody outside about, you know, I'm getting, you know, all we did was just get a whole bunch of AC contacts. Yeah. And it was at that moment that I realized, like, bro, I'm afraid to talk to people. Yeah. Like, and that's what, it, like, literally what literally it was. It is, yeah. And now it's, that would never happen again in my lifetime. But that's what it was. And he was like, bro, you just walked by so many people. And then he, and he just, he, I was like, no, I didn't. And he was like, bro, the guy in the red hoodie. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, shit, the guy in the red hoodie. And he was like, this guy, this guy, this guy. I was like, oh, crap. I didn't so like that it. happened the other day when I was in Monmouth with, uh, with Cuevas and, and the team. I went in there at first and sat there in Cuevas and we're walking around. Uh, there was a table full of kids sitting down. Some are eating, some are just bullshitting, right? And uh, I, I looked at him and he's like, he's like, he's like, oh, no, I'm good. I don't, I don't do that. People sitting down and eating, I don't talk to them. I was like, okay, well, that's why you won't be successful. And you know, we kept on going and I'm looking at another kid, looking at another kid, looking at another kid. I was like, are you going to gonna talk to anybody? He's like, oh, you know, I'm just, just trying to find the right kid. It's like, all right, that's why you're not going to be successful. You know, because again, I can do it for him, but yeah. what is he gonna learn by me doing it, yeah. right? So, so like that, it becomes a lot of it becomes that, right? Because yeah. even even Tara Smith said to me like, "So I'm gonna like, you know, I just you know just need someone to go out there, you know, and AC with me, kind of chill." And I was like, "No, you don't. You don't. You don't. You don't need anyone to go out there and AC with you. You know what to do. 
Mm-hmm. You've been trained and taught what to do, and you've done it before. Yeah. You just don't want to do it. There's a yeah. difference. Yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah. trying to be mean to you or anything like that, but I'm just being real and being yeah. honest with you. You just don't want to do it. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. So when we went to the Monmouth, to yeah, when we went to the Monmouth Mall with the team, same thing again. I'm not talking to anybody, and I'm like, see, so it's a choice. It is a choice. You're choosing not to talk to somebody. Yeah. It's not that you have the inability to talk to them. Maybe your sales is terrible. So what? That's irrelevant. I'm not asking you to be a professionist. Uh, when it comes to sales, yeah. what I'm asking you is just, just to talk to somebody. Yeah. You know, get a name and a phone number or a name and any contact information just you can. Start a conversation. To follow. That's it. Yeah. That is it. That's a pure, simple, basic. So when I got to South Jersey, um, I was told when I got down to say, hey, you know, the Marines down there, they don't AC at all. Everything they do is on the phone, blah, blah, blah. I was like, all right, sounds good. I checked out the numbers. I looked at the stuff because the numbers, they give you a picture. They don't tell you what happened in the picture, right? Yeah. So I'm looking at it and I'm like, all right, cool. I, I can get an idea of what's going on here. Uh, all right, Marines, check it out. Let them do what they got to do. Bring them in. I provided training on AC technique, right? We went over AC, freaking hope the role plays, did everything, the way to go, blah, 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 all that stuff. Did everything, right? Go. You've been trained. You've been taught how to do it. Go. Go execute it. Because they're, they're, they, they've been around for a minute, you know? It's not like they're brand new Marines who just came out from BRC. They've been around for a minute, so go. Go do it. Our ACs went up. Our contacts obviously went up because the ACs. Our appointments went up. Our interviews went up. And we started making contracts. So there was a direct correlation between making contact with an individual face-to-face yeah. as opposed to being on the phones. Yeah. So going back to your, your point of, well, you're being told you're going to make your TC objective. I'm hit right now, right now, on my C at Matrix. I'm being hit for TC objective per Marine not being attained. Uh, because the highest I have is 14% for one of my Marines. And the lowest, I believe, is like 2%, 3%. Yeah. Um, which, again, I agree, not good at all, right? Yeah. You're at 80%, yeah, 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 maybe yeah, a lot better, like, right? Yeah. It's really low. Yeah. Well, it, it's like that for a reason. Because if they're constantly on the phone and they're making contact with mommy and daddy, and mommy and daddy's like, hey, Johnny and Susie's not home, well, then what do I do at that point in time? Well, if Johnny and Susie's not home, where's Johnny and Susie? I'm in the streets. Well, guess yeah. where I should be at? On the streets, because yeah. that's where Johnny and Susie's at, yeah. right? So there become there needs to be a balance. Yeah, and I think balance is the key, right? Yeah. Balance is the key. If there's a balance, and I think that's what's great about when the high school college program opens up, that you have that balance now, right? Because yeah. you have the AC ability in the schools, because you're all stuck in there. Mm-hmm. And then when you get out of the school, now you have some more AC, but now you can freaking TC as well, right? Yeah. So um, you know, there, there needs to be a balance between making TC, making TC at the right time. You know, understanding your market, your demographic, your list, what the best times are to call your list. And then from there, doing everything you can to make it the most effective time frame that you call your list. Yeah. And that's the thing, too, is like, you that's know, the hard part. and that's the thing, too, is like now, you know, 20, you know, hindsight's 2020 looking back at it. It's like nobody uses the, the list scheduling card the way it's supposed to. Right. Yeah. Like if you actually use yeah. it the way it's supposed to, like we're talking about, mm-hmm. it's like, bro, it wouldn't make sense. Because yeah. the reality of it is that if you... If there was a recruiter who sat there for three years using his light, his his list scheduling card, and then you check in, there, you right? now have three years of data to say, oh shit, dude, every Monday they never worked for right. this guy, but on Mondays at this time it worked because now you would already know that. You're like, oh shit, I'll never make phone calls until Monday. At- One of my biggest pet peeves is notes. In yeah. Me, Chris, when people don't put anything inside a note, yeah, it it just it drives me nuts. Cause like, I get McChris is a flawed system and has yeah. so many different errors, but. There are certain things that they did in McChris that make it like it makes it beautiful. That box right there, and not to validate myself, right? But the scheduling card used to be on an actual card. Yeah. So I used to have to write on the card what the freaking hell my result was, right? So we had data back in the day to know, hey, don't call at this freaking time because you can see here on your list scheduling card that ain't the freaking time to call. Mm-hmm. In McChris, you have it even better to where you just click it and it's not written in hieroglyphics. Well, yeah. submarine freaking hieroglyphics can't write. <laughs> yeah. You can easily read that it says, hey, yeah. don't call at this time. Call at this time, zero contacts, blah, 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 whatever yeah. your note is. It takes maybe, maybe, maybe at the most, on Chris's worst day, a minute, yeah. a minute to, to close out an event. Yeah. A minute, a one minute yeah. to close out an event on its worst day. If not, maybe 25, 30 seconds if yeah. everything's rolling fast. Yeah. And it takes you maybe 25 to 30 seconds to put in a note. If yeah. you really think about like what I want to say, hey, you know, call the list, freaking no answer, got a couple moms, got a couple dads, got a couple kids to follow up with, uh, done. You know what I'm saying? That all together doesn't take you more than a minute. Yeah. Right? But again, what do we do? Yeah. We just close out the event, 
Yeah. yeah we don't or we don't close out all the way. Or don't to close the out the event at all, right? Thing, yeah. And don't put it out in there. Yeah. And then we freaking do the same thing again. Yeah. Then we do the same thing again. Again. And they were like, well, all the way man, Hawk's not doing anything good, right? Exactly. Then SRR trying to fix everything, right? And now we're putting in notes. Yeah, you know, so it's like, it's like, why is it that on the daily you can't, and that becomes on the staff IC, right? Freaking yeah. looking and showing that, that, that that's happening. That's right? where validation right, needs right. to happen. So it's like, it, it's it's the hard part of, of doing that, juggling all those different things. Yeah. And sometimes you can have to let some fall to the wayside because there's something else that you need to hold to your wayside, mm-hmm. right? So you, you have to like pick and choose your battles and how you're going about things. I'll be honest, over the last couple of months, when it came to Chris, I really wasn't concerned because the new FY was about to start up, yeah. and I didn't want to have to fix everything that was not done for the past year. So yeah. I was like, ah, that, yeah. you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if you yeah. log, highly important to me. That's yeah. gonna be pristine. Got it. Everything else, I'm gonna train to and start mm-hmm. developing so like that. Come the new FY, my expectation is not my reality. I expect notes. You don't put notes in there, we have a freaking problem. Period. Yeah. Sarah Morgan, I had a conversation the other day. Sarah Morgan, where's my notes? Uh, good. I forgot. No, 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 no. No, no, fuck your forgot. Yeah. Your forgot. Your, your past, I forgot. <laughs> it's been 90 days already, and I already told you numerous times that I need notes in here, period. You do it again, we're going to have a fucking different kind of conversation. Mm. And again, I'm, I'm not being a douchebag about it. I'm yeah, taking the exact same tone of voice I just said. Days, yeah, yeah, the exact same voice I just used right now is the exact same thing I, I said before. You know, so it's like, I'm not trying to be a douchebag about it, but like, you have to understand, like, I'm going to give you certain things. Yeah. There's certain things I'm going to expect that you give me. Yeah. And if you don't give me those things that I expect, and I expect those things for a specific reason, because they're going to benefit you in the long run. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because again, that's me looking at it and saying, well, I don't want to be the person to make comfort-based decisions. Mm-hmm. I don't want to make a decision out of fear. I don't want control. Yeah. But I need to control this in order to help you yeah. control something else down the road. Yeah. So me knowing those things now and trying to make those decisions based off of not being out of fear, not being in control, uh, it's a scary thing not being in control. You know what I'm saying? We want control all the time. But we have to learn to give control up in order to get what we need in the long run. Mm-hmm. And, and that's that's going to be like one of the biggest struggles that anyone who's, who has to be a staff so I see ha- is going to have to face. Because that, that's that's the worst part. Yeah. So what about, um, so I know this is probably a huge thing, but just personal life. Because you recently spent, what, four years away from your son? Three. Uh, no, so, mm, so I was gone to Oregon for three years. I went out to Oregon in... Uh, 2017, yeah. Yeah, 2017. So went out to Oregon 2017, just came back this past year. Uh, so three years. Um, my wife and son moved back from Oregon, uh, I want to say about two years ago. So it was roughly roughly about you know a year and a half, year, year, maybe two years, uh, to where my son was back out here yeah. uh, and everything like that. So, so um, yeah. the reason why I asked that question is because while you were, while all of that was going on, you were still... <laughs> Doing your job as an A four twelve, you were still a staff at USC. You were an OSO. You were a MEPS liaison. Am I missing anything? No, just those two. Okay, but you were still doing your job, and yeah. a lot of people like to say, "Oh, I can't do this because this is going on in my personal life." Yeah, and I'm not saying that personal life is not paramount and it shouldn't be, but how did you, how did you manage that and continue to make sure that you were holding yourself accountable as an A four twelve to do those things? Yeah, for, while that was that's a good question. I I, I kind of. Who was I talking about? I was talking to somebody the other day about this. Uh, actually, you know, Sergeant Jack Leonard and I got into a large, large, large discussion because he was mad at me about some stuff. <laughs> um, and it, he was, you know, he was fine with it. And it wasn't like it was a bad thing, you know. Uh, there should be an open up conversation. Should be, he's a sergeant. I'm a gun sergeant. Shut the fuck up. It should, yeah. it should be an open conversation. Like, yeah, 100%. You, have a, you have a feeling about something? Tell yeah. me. Let, let me. Let me explain to you why. And the problem was that I had not explained the why mm. a decision was made. Yeah. And then when he found out the why, he was like, Oh shit! Yeah, 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 I get it now, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and then part of me is like, well, bitch, it wasn't for you to get. Just do your fucking job. Yeah. But then it's like, no, we're in twenty twenty one. It's not like me when I was a recruiter. Yeah. I didn't give a fuck with the whatever was going on. What was I responsible for? What did you need me to do? Yeah. Find contracts. I staff sergeant. Yeah. I'm fucking go find that. So I it's think, different. And that's the thing. Yeah. I, it's I, different. Like it, it's so different. And it's, it's different like it's such yeah. a different world. But you have to adapt to that. You have yeah. to understand that that is the world that we live in now. And I can't, I can't be like, oh, well, the way I did it in the past, blah, 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 because yeah. we're not in the past anymore. It's the present now. The present, I, I think, work from the present. I wish we had this conversation while this happened to us, because I think that was a huge part of me, right. was just like, bro, just go do it. Yeah. Like, no one ever needed to tell me to yeah, go yeah. find contracts, because that was my job. Yeah. Like, that was I, my I, job. I, just I go agree. do your job. I agree. Like, why is this even a conversation? I, I, or like, I don't, I don't you know. You know, like, you know Master Gunny Baker, but yeah. like... 
Master Gunny Baker's thing always was, at least when I was in Lift Club, I remember him always saying it when someone would be like, I tried. Yeah. He'd be tried. like, What the fuck does that mean? Yeah. I tried. Or hope. Yeah. yeah hope. Yeah. Hope. Hope, hope, hope is a course of action, Marie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but, like, so. you know, and that's the thing is, like, a lot of people say that, you yeah. know, oh, I tried or I hope. And it's like, Bro, just go and do it. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. so what no, was it for you that was going on? So, so, you know, it was different because I made a lot of, I made a lot of, bad decisions, bad choices when it came to my marriage, my family, uh, what was important to me, and then recruiting. Mm. I've always taken it back to, you know, I'm a Marine, right? And, and that's, you know, you kind of asked me, who is Rock the Jump, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm a Marine, yeah. right? And, and that for me, on its own, is enough. Is enough to be like, okay, cool. The most important thing is the job, the mission, the Marines, right? Mission accomplishment, troop welfare. Mission accomplishment, true growth. We, we were taught that somewhere yeah. at one point in life. But for some reason on recruiting duty, it doesn't exist. Well, and to a certain extent, it does. Yeah. To a certain extent, it does. Well, right? no, I, so, I was being like... No, no, no. I, I, no, no. I, I agree with you because <laughs> that that's where we come into the problem that it can. It can. It's just a matter of the individuals it? that makes and it that, not. And that's the thing is it's like, what the fuck does it take? Well, you have because to everybody that. wants their cake and they want to eat it too. Okay. And everyone's mad that, right. oh, well, I don't have quality of life. Well, okay, yeah. well, what are you doing to get quality well, what, of life? What is quality of life? That, that's the thing that I I, I, I despise the most when, when people bring it up. Mm -hmm. They were trying to get you guys a better quality of life. Like... I don't need someone else to give me a better quality of life. Well, I can get that myself. Well, and also my your quality of life is different between me. Right, and I, I agree with that as subjective. well. Yeah, I, I agree with that as well. So, so um, what what is quality of life, right? Well, how does that differ between each Marine? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it they want as far as to have a quality of life? Because if you have a single Marine who doesn't have a family, then what is quality of life for them? They don't want to go home. Right. Yeah. They, maybe they don't care, but maybe they do want to go home, well, they but they don't want to go home for a different, or, yeah, 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 you know what I'm saying? Maybe they're being a hoe out on the streets. You know, yeah, yeah. who knows? Whatever the they want to do, right? Uh, that, that, that's on them. So it's like, what is what is each, in, each individual's quality of life? My quality of life now is different from what it was before. Yeah. My quality of life now is trying to be with my family, spend time with my family and stuff like that. That's my quality of life now. My quality of life before was making mission, being successful, and people being out of my office. That was my quality of life. I can control what I was doing. I can leave whenever I wanted to. I can do whatever I wanted to do because I was making mission and no one was bothering me, right? So for me, that became a quality of life. It wasn't until I actually um, I learned quality of life, actually when I got to OSA, uh, when I was working with Captain Teeny, uh, the officer selection officer out in Oregon. A huge mentor, a huge mentor. I'll tell you what. If I would have not gone to the OSA when I did, I would not be the person I am now. Oh, wow. It, it's truly, it's truly like that, that, that impactful. Different. Yeah, it, it truly was, and it was not just because I was dealing with you know officer stuff, like, but it was because of the the mentorship and leadership that I had from Captain Teeny mm. that that helped me. I've had some good leaders. I have some great leaders in the Marine Corps. Uh, he wasn't as it's not this is probably gonna sound bad, but he wasn't to me a Marine Corps leader or mentor. He to me was a person, mm. man, mentor leader. Yeah, right, yeah. That was different. That was better. Because yeah. I didn't need him to be a Marine Corps mentor to me because I'm an 8412. I've been in Marine Corps for, at that time, 16 years. Clearly, had been there for maybe 10 years, you know, whatever. So I was senior to him in the fact that I've had more experience. I've been on recruiting duty for a while. So yeah. he wasn't teaching me anything recruiting wise. I was teaching him stuff recruiting wise. He was teaching me things on how to be a man, you know, how to, how to be a father. And he wasn't even a father. He was teaching me how to be a husband. And he just was a brand new husband. Mm -hmm. You know, he was giving me examples that I really didn't see or understand or know. That when we would have this conversation, these long conversations, you know, because at that time was when, when you know, things, you know, started going really bad uh, for me and my marriage and everything like that. So when all that happened, he was like the person I was able to talk to with tears in my eyes, crying, you know, and he would like, he would reassure me, he'd, you know, he'd help me understand like, hey, this is what you need to do, this is how you do it, you know. And those lessons, those things that I learned is what helped me now be who I am now. Uh, and without those lessons, hard fall lessons, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. So, you know, when you say, you know, quality of life, uh, when you say, how do you continue doing your job? At the end of the day, being a Marine is my sole purpose yeah. right now. That's, that's what I do. Yeah. So I have to ensure that no matter how bad my situation was at home, that I took care of that applicant, that candidate, yeah. or that poolie or whoever it was at that time, because my problems is not their problems. Yeah. Yeah. So why should I bring my problems into their life? 
My job is not to, to do that. My job is to help them become successful for whatever they define success to be. Mm-hmm. Based off our conversation, if they define success to be becoming a Marine so that they, they can get whatever they want later on down the road, then my job, my goal was to help them become a Marine, period. That's it. There was nothing else to it. Yeah. Everything I did, any decision that I ever made for any candidate or employee was in their best interest to help them become a Marine, not for me, yeah. right? So, so you know, for me, it became like, I'm a Marine and I have to freaking do my job. I think so it helped that, out as a distraction. I think that's the part that people forget. Yeah. And I, and, you know, and I had this conversation, um, and uh, I guess some when I had this conversation, people didn't agree with me, but um, we were reading this book called Legacy. Okay, you I've heard of it. Read, have you ever read I've it? I've never read it. I don't it's read. A, I hate reading but it. But I heard, I heard, I heard the it. Really audible, the audible's yeah. great because it has right. the guy's British accent. Oh, okay, okay. So it's really good. It's about the, uh, but, the rugby uh, team, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I got the book at home. Yeah. Never so gonna they're, read they're, they're pretty much just talking about how the rugby team, they do the, I think it's called the Haka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they do the same ritual every game, every time. Right. They do the same thing. They sweep the sheds. They... Everything they do the every day, do, right? yeah. The, yeah, yeah. So every one of them, like they do the same thing. They have this ritual, and it always goes. And when we were we were tasked to read the book at the annual planning conference, mm. and then when we get to the annual planning conference, and the commanding officer at the time says, "Hey, who read it?" Nobody read it. Then he was like, "Okay, well, if you did read it, what you think about it?" And I was just like, "Well, we've lost our legacy." And he, he was like, what do you mean? And I was like, we've lost our legacy. Major like, Sharper? No, Major oh. Fallon. Oh, okay. And um, he was like, and I, and I was like, well, because the Marines in this RS don't do anything that has to do with the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. We run a PFT, we run a CFT, we have a ball, but we haven't had a ball because of COVID. So besides those three things... Out. So because those three things, we don't do anything Marine Corps related. Right. So when you, when we as leaders get mad that these Marines don't act like they're Marines, it's like, well, what was the last time sure. they did a Marine Corps thing? Yeah. So true. we, so um, like, so this book made me realize that we've lost our legacy because we do nothing Marine Corps related. We don't have mess nights. We don't have, yeah. we don't do anything. We don't have warriors nights. We don't do anything. We have Earl where you can literally go and do a freaking warriors night like they did back yeah, in the yeah. day. Yeah, Sergeant Williams, you were there. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. Like Roman was there. Yeah, yeah. Like um, Major Campbell. It was it was hard like, because it was during the NFL draft one of the years yeah. that Jet yeah. had like a number three pick. Well, and I then they did it, and then they did a um, a breathalyzer the next morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah I was, I was like, like, what are we doing? Yeah, like yeah. you know, we all just drink all yeah. in a tent, and then they whatever. But the point of the matter though was like that was a good camaraderie building for the Marines, right? And that was my point that was coming across. And then one of the gunnery sergeants, um, female, was like, "Well, that's your job as a staff in CIC," and I was like, "But that, I'm in an office. I have a fire team." Yeah. I was like, we have a company of Marines right. that want to go out and just do things and be Marines, even if it's just once a month, yeah. even if it's quarterly. Like, I think that that's something that the Marine Corps, like, again, I'm, I can't speak for Marine Corps recruiting duty yeah. because, like, I've never been in every RS in this, you know, in, in the world. But that was what pained me is, like, I'd be on recruiting duty and I'd see dudes in RS Atlanta or where, I don't know the name of it. But like other RSs that are at clubs that are having you know mess nights that are doing yeah. all hands at, at bars or in Vegas they do their all hands at a casino and it's like well Jersey used to do that but again we, again those so, are the yeah. things that it's like bro those are things that Marines want they want camaraderie because if there's never a day away from work then it's just three years of time that you're never yeah. gone yeah I don't I don't disagree with you on that at all um, you know obviously. Not having a ball, uh, kind of, kind of sucks. Uh, not that kind of, kind of. It does, it does suck. Uh, substituting with the mess night uh, would be beneficial in some way, some capacity, something to honor the fact that we're Marines. Um, I do agree that we we've kind of lost that legacy. I understand to a certain extent how you can control within your office the Marine like environment and whatnot. I get that to a certain extent, but it's not the same like you said. Yeah. You know, with having a fire yeah. team and having a platoon uh, and everything like that. Uh, what can we do to change that? It's difficult on recruiting duty because uh, we're dealing with a lot of things when it comes to money, yeah. finances, when it comes to location, and then now you're throwing in freaking COVID into the equation. But then most importantly, the number one thing there becomes mission, right? Yeah. So if you have a station that's failing and missing mission, and you have other stations that have to overwrite, then what is the likelihood of those Marines who have to overwrite yeah. want to go hang out with the Marines who fucking failed mission? So here's, here's something that I've always said and have yet to see it done, and I think that if it was done things would change. Okay. If you 
So uh, you have all hands every yeah. month, right? Yeah. Due to COVID, that changes with it, whatever. But most of the time, you have all hands, right? Mm-hmm. In all hands, what happens? You go to all hands, you get some BS training that needs to get done, or you get the MC3 modules that had to get done, which I'm not right. saying is BS because it needs to get done, right? But you go through these MC3, MC3 modules, and then after you go through that, then you get the awards, then all right, see you guys later, right? Right. The nine times out of ten, how, how it rolls, right? Most recently, yes. Okay. So what if, what if, maybe this happened back in the day, okay. but what if all the ARIs left the fucking room? Okay. All the staff in CYC has left the fucking room. Okay. And your heavy hitters sat in the room mm-hmm. and started fucking talking shit to everybody. Like, hey, motherfucker, why do I have to be a heavy hitter? Right. I don't want to be a heavy hitter. Hey, motherfucker, why am I overwriting every month? Because you're not. Right. And those are conversations that should be had. Because if you think about it, there's like there's this dude who just got out of the Marine Corps, Turner. Okay. I only met him like four or five times in four years on recruiting duty. Me and him, if we had more of a chance to pick each other's brain like we're doing right now, yeah. how much better of a recruiter would I have been and how much better of a recruiter would he have been? Why is all of the training just simply a PowerPoint, MC3 modules? Why isn't it, hey man, what's working on what's working in your AO? Right. Hey man, what are you doing when you're when your TCs aren't working? Hey man, you know, you sound like like my like um Stats aren't Ebok and okay. he just got off recruiting yeah, duty. Yeah. He was in Tom's River. He came and he sat down with us and he was telling Cuevas about how he's, um, what do you call that word? Um, he's an introvert. Okay. So now an introvert was talking to an introvert on how to be successful on recruiting duty. Yeah. And it was like, why isn't that always happening? Because, yeah, I get it. Again, the MC3 modules, the MC4, all those things have to get done because they're, per- they're part of the training mm-hmm. for the year. I get right. that. But once that's done, why don't we just do training to where, hey, man, what are you struggling with? Hey, what are you having a fucking horrible time at? Oh, I'm really bad at this. Okay, well, what do you do? Because you're actually really good at it. How do you do it? That would be... Okay, so... To play devil's advocate. Like it. How, how would... If I'm a struggling Marine, right? If I'm that struggling Marine, right? And every time at all hands, I see stats on Ben and go out there and get a different fucking color bat. You got a damn rainbow fucking rainbow bat, right? And, and I'm like, man, that guy fucking... Stats on Ben, he's fucking good. I fucking suck. That's the end of it. Yeah. When is that Marine who sucks gets up and go up to Staff Sergeant Davis or Staff Sergeant Bennett and say, hey, uh, Staff Sergeant Bennett, how do you do that? How is it that you're so good? What is it you're doing yeah. that's so good? You know what? Can you come down and come work with me? So what you're asking for, you're asking for every Marine in the RSS, or I'm sorry, the RS to be, every recruiter, I should say, every campus recruiter in the RS to freaking be able to stand up there the big dudes, the heavy hitters, and be like, hey, motherfuckers, why aren't you guys fucking doing what the hell you need to do? That guy in the back who fucking sucks, or maybe he's been around for maybe a year and he's fucking trash, doesn't bring anything to the fucking table, maybe ones and twosies. Um, the, okay, that's Quavos. Let's say Quavos when Quavos first got here, right? Fucking trash. Horrible. Terrible, right? We're not bringing anything to the table. When does Stephen Quavos stand up and go to any heavy hitter and say, hey, um, can I get some help? You know? well, that's what I'm saying, though. It's but that's not, the self-starter so, thing. That's the initiative, right? We're yeah. talking about leadership. That's on that individual Marine to want to get up and go do that. Yeah. That's not all, all hands. That's not the purpose of all hands. All hands is is to to go over what's going to be happening next and provide the training for that. Now, if they want to have, because I did it before with all the staff I sees. Uh, I was like, I was like, oh, you know, sir, yeah, if you give us some time for a game, we can talk. I said, hey, guys, like, what the hell is going on? We're missing this. We're missing that. We're missing that. We're missing some basic things. So I had a conversation with them at Staff Sergeant C's on like what to do and how to do it, right? So why don't we have a Marine who is a heavy hitter stand up and, and say, hey, sir, you know I'm going to fight if we get a minute with all the Marines and the officers out the ARI and all the 8412s and, and all the Staff Sergeant C's out so we could just talk amongst ourselves? When did you do that? Mm. You see my point? So so that, that's, that's what it comes down to. Like wh- who is going to be the one to jump up and take that initiative Will that heavy hitter want to do that? Yeah. You know, will that heavy hitter want to be like, hey, motherfuckers, do your damn job, blah, 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 Because it, it's happening as far as you guys suck from afar. Yeah. Oh, man, here we go. We got to freaking help out Mammoth again. Another yeah. month where Mammoth's going to miss mission again. 
right? Yeah. Because that becomes the, the image and persona that mom has now after freaking several months, except for the month I took over, I went to eighth grade, so that's point. Um, you know, but, but that, that's, the, that's the image and, and the, the idea that they have about mom is because mom is going to constantly miss. You know, mm-hmm. so, all right, cool, mom is always going to miss. So you got freaking guys that let's say Northwest who are freaking over contracting, or some of them are over contracting for freaking Monmouth. And then one of those guys, one of those Marines in that office coming down to freaking Monmouth and saying, What the fuck are you guys doing? Yeah. Because why does why does the command need to provide that environment for you? That that's not. So think of it as a, a sports team, right? You might hear from time to time, oh the, the team the players had a closed door meeting without the manager inside. Well, what happened inside that room? Well, we don't know. The closed door, freaking the, the players talking amongst themselves. Maybe sometimes you hear about a fight coming out of there and whatnot. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Where is that within RS anything between the recruiters themselves? The reason why it doesn't happen is they don't give a fuck. It's that simple. It's because they don't give a fuck because you have your piece of your pie. You have your AO, your stuff that you're dealing with. They have their own problems that they're dealing with. And they're like, oh, you don't understand. You're not a mom. Yeah. That's what they say. Oh, oh no one understands. I've, I've, I've I know, that. I know. But that's, that's what they say. Like, because no like you're not in Monmouth. Because you know that you don't know exactly. unless you've been in Monmouth. So, so it's like, it's like. But hold oh. on, you know I'm right. Oh no no no! Listen, <laughs> I'm not gonna. Bro, you how many? Artists? I didn't say I didn't say because I was there. But yes, Monmouth is a difficult AO. It is. A, it, is. it is an animal. But 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 you cannot go in there with the mindset of saying, oh, it's a difficult AO. You have to go in there with the mindset no, of yeah. like, I have to do this. Yeah. Right. And because the chosen reservoir was a difficult AO. And they fucking did it, yeah. right? But it was a different fucking area, and they fucking did it. So again, we could always make the, the excuse and the complaint of say, "Oh man, I have a hard AO." Yeah. But there have been actual lives lost in harder fucking AOs, yeah. and you're still alive. Yeah, you yeah. may be fat now because you're not eating right and everything like that. You're mm-hmm. fucking depressed, but you're still fucking alive. Yeah. You're not in a fucking battle somewhere across the world where you're gonna die. And no one's ever gonna find your remains again. Mm-hmm. So. Is it really that hard of an AO? Yeah. So we have to get out of that mentality of, oh, it's a hard AO. Yes, it's a difficult AO. Yeah. Yes, there's some it's problems. Not but nothing's impossible. Well, that's what, I, your and that's what I would do. That's why when Quavos would say that shit, mm-hmm. I'd be like, bro. He's like, but you don't get it. It's Monmouth. I'm like, bitch, shut the fuck up. Yeah. Because Monmouth, at one point or another, was a prosperous place. Yes. Monmouth was killing it. Yeah. Like, it pains me to see. I know. It, it pains you to see yeah. it. Yeah. Massar and Diaz. Massar yeah. and Diaz are like, what'd you do to my baby? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's because it, it should be a great piece of land. But, all right, so then we can agree that, okay, maybe the command doesn't say, hey, here's your allotted time. Somebody with some big balls needs yes. to stand up and say, hey, bitch. There's nothing wrong with that. We all need to get in here. 100%. Because I think. That, that's I an think, internal thing. But I think cross multiplying isn't happening. No, I, think I would, I would agree. I, I would, I would agree that that more likely is not the case. But yet again, it goes back to why is that not happening? And it goes back to again, I have my own shit to deal with. Like I get it, man. I'm over contracting and everything like that because you're not doing your fucking shit. But fuck, man. Like I gotta do what I gotta do for me because yeah. I want to freaking have whatever I want to have, right? So it becomes to each individual marine to internally want to have that. I need to be successful. I need to freaking do what I need to do. I need to help the team out. Yeah, we don't have that more often than not. And you have your ones and twos where like, oh man, this sucks. Oh well, I'm and it's like it's whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, well, how do we get those guys to turn around? Well, you don't. You don't. You don't get those you guys don't. to turn around. I don't care what anyone says. You don't. They're they motivated, blah, blah. No. 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 If they want to, they will. If and they if don't they want don't. to, they won't. It's that simple. And, and so how do we how do we get that person who doesn't want to to want to? Well, like I just said, you really can't. Mm-hmm. What we can do is you can try to talk to them, to get them to buy in, to train them, provide them the mentorship and leadership that they need in order to be successful and want to desire to be successful. Because yeah. again, it goes back, if you're a Marine, I don't anticipate you saying, I want to fail. If you're a Marine, I anticipate you saying, I want to succeed at all costs. However, comma, but so life, ha- but life for, gets in the way. But And on top of that, it's just like for some reason, and I used to say, like I used to compute it to like this, right? I remember, like when I was when I was in charge of land, like when I was on uh, in the reserves, we'd have lance corporals who were like doctors, mm-hmm. CEOs of their own companies, yeah, yeah. like they had like legitimate careers outside right. of the Marine Corps. Then they would come to drill, and this dude couldn't blouse his boots. <laughs> this dude couldn't put his uniform on. Right, right. And I'd be like, bro, why is it <laughs> that when you put your uniform on, yeah. you just become dumbfounded? Right, right. It's like, and that's what it is. Like Marines were so great, not all of them, but some of them were so great out in the fleet 
and then they come out here and it's like, oh, dude, like whatever, yeah. Well, think about it. It's like when you signed the contract, you signed a contract to become a career recruiter or a recruiter. No, no. you signed a contract to do a specific job. But so you've been taught your whole career to never fail, to never be okay with failing, and to and, and, and I got you. I'm not just fine failure at all. So understand what I'm saying. This I'm not just fine failure. However, what I'm saying is that uh, you and it's who, who was it? Someone told me a long time ago. I can't remember who it was. Um, when you come on a recruiting duty, you're you're a private again. Yeah. Right? You're probably getting, and you have to then get promoted out here mentally and progress yourself into becoming a sergeant, staff sergeant, so yeah. on and so forth, right? So it was like, you come out here and you're, you're private. You don't know anything. You freaking, you're like, yo, what the hell's going on? You need to yeah. be told what to do with everything. And then once you kind of figure it out, then, you know, we have a peak performance model, with, you know, recruiting, right? Peak performance model. So it's same, same, same concept, same idea, right? So again, as you're, as you're looking at that brand new Marine who just came out here, how do I help influence and change their mindset to be away from everyone else's mindset, right? Or who well, are negative? I think before you even get into that, I think a huge part of it is understanding. And I feel like they don't tell you that on rec- in, in BRC. Like, I think a huge part of it is an understanding, like, yo, I get you're a gunny. But when you come out on this duty, you got to understand that you're, you're you're a gunnery sergeant in respect to gunnery right, sergeant. Right, right, right. But realistically, yeah. you're, you don't know anything about this duty. So let a sergeant, if it's a sergeant, fucking right. teach you. Right. Because that's a huge part of it is yeah. people don't want to – they. Like, people come out here with this chip on their shoulder, and they're like, hey, man, I'm a gunny. You're not going to tell me. And it's like, well, actually, that's the yeah. guy that knows what he's doing. He's been out here for two years. When they fail, though, to. then it'll work, exactly. it'll all work out. And the, but you by know? that time, it's like seven months in, and you're like, oh, yeah. shit, I could have used this seven months ago. Yeah, exactly. So and I think you need to come out here part. understanding that, like, yes, I'm a gunnery sergeant, but realistically, in this position, I'm a private. Right, yeah. And I think that's people don't even think about that. And yeah. you should come out here with that thought in your head, like, I'm learning an MOS I've never done before. Right. No, I, 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 I agree with that. And I mean, that, that does become one of the things where, why do we send guys out here who are about to become a gunny anyway? Besides the point, right? I don't, I don't control that. That's not within my, my, my purview or anything like that. But however, it, it's something that I wonder or, or myself. Or why do we send out gunnies who are about to be a mess on Yeah. Like, exactly. how do hey, it doesn't, like, I don't, I don't understand the concept either. Um, like, I how mean, does that happen? I truly feel like the perfect rank should be the, a brand new sergeant. Or, or a sergeant who needs to get promoted, yeah, yeah. you know that's like the perfect the perfect area, right? Mm-hmm. Because it leaves room for growth for leadership, but it also leaves a, a hunger and a tenacity to want to get promoted and want to be successful, and then be still young enough to yeah. be molded, yeah. and not someone who's like a staff sergeant for like well, three or four years, exactly. Who's like, oh man, like, like, and then if, this, if you, know? you send that a sergeant who just picked up sergeant, right? Then he's gonna be out of his MOS as a sergeant for three years, and then probably pick up staff sergeant. Right. So then he literally the whole entire rank of sergeant wasn't even in the fleet. Right. Because that happens too. That, that does but happen. I, too. But again, I, but I, I get can, that. I, but I, that can get figured out once they go back out to their MOS school and then get back out to the fleet, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So that that can get figured out. Yeah. The hunger for the individual, whether out here knowing that oh shit, I get promoted to staff sergeant while out here, is gonna increase because they're a sergeant and they want to get promoted. Yeah. I would assume they want to get promoted. Uh, if they at least want a successful tour of duty. And they're also more moldable as a sergeant because you're in that middle ground, right? Mm-hmm. You're in the middle ground to where you, you, you can't really be like, ah, I don't fucking know. But you're like, well, I really don't know. You're like in the middle ground like, well, I'm here to learn. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? Because you're really there. Or recruiting you as a sergeant, you're like, you're like I, I, I can learn. You know? Um, so I think that's like the, the perfect the perfect rank or the, the perfect individual to kind of get out here as opposed to, like, you know, a staff sergeant who's on his way out the door or a gunnery sergeant who just got promoted um, – or who's about to get promoted as a master sergeant. I mean, for those guys, I don't understand why they bring them out here. But yeah. again, that's that's not on me for for, for that part. But. So here's like a ending kind of cap to the to it. How do you? And this is a huge problem that I had as a staff in CIC is how do you correlate yourself and and make sure that you are a leader, but at the same time where your Marines can come and talk to you. So like where you know. There's, there's clearly a delegation, there's a delegation between the two. So like, hey, we're boys. Mm-hmm. But it's like, that was my problem. Yeah. It's like, I wanted to be able to, I felt that we should be able to work in an office together. Mm-hmm. And then on the weekends, our family should be able to come together. Okay. But then other people didn't agree with that. They were like, no, yeah. you need to separate church and state. Right, yeah. Like, there needs to be a clear discussion. Like, you're the staff in CYC, they're the recruiters. Yeah. So that was a huge problem for me because yeah. like, for me, a lot of the reason why I think Monmouth was good for the 10 months that I was there is because, like, we all lived, breathed with each other. 
our families knew each other, our kids grew up together because it was all like, okay, well, if we don't make mission, well, then we can't have this time. Right. We can't go play board games and chill or whatever. But that was as a recruiter. What? That was as a recruiter. No, that was when I was a staff okay. Okay. It was both. Because okay. like when I when I came back to Monmouth, that was so in the time that I was away from Monmouth for seven months, that that was gone. Right. Like so while I was on recruiting duty with those Marines, but when I was a recruiter, we would all go out together, we would do things together, and then when I left, they stopped that. Right. And it was just, hey, we're all gonna go to work and then the gunnery sergeant who was in charge was like, No, like yeah. you guys are the troops and I'm this guy and we're mm-hmm. not at all, you know what I mean? Yeah. But me, I was like, well, if we have a family as an office, then we're all going to work together because if we don't, then it's more like I know Nicole. Right. So when you don't go home tonight, Nicole knows that it's my fault that right. you didn't come home. And, you know, or Rebecca or whatever. And it became more of like an onus on the family member. And it was like, oh, shit, I fucked you and your family over. Right. But other people's ideas are, okay, well, then you were too close to your Marines and they the way that they spoke to you or the way that you guys did just the delegation. So my question is, what is the happy medium? I mean, or, yeah. or are you the person like Gunny Ledbetter? Gunny Ledbetter all the time, like, hey, bro, you need to stop. Yeah. And like, he's like, bro, stop being fucking boys yeah. with your recruiters. Um, Gunny Odenbrett, hey, yeah. bro, stop being fucking boys with your recruiters. Yeah. And it's like, okay, where's the... So I, I come from their tree line. Uh, Odenbrett, friggin', you know, friggin'... Led better, like we're, we're all from the same, 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 uh, same time frame of recruiting and everything like that. I agree with them. Uh, there has to be there, there, there has to be a line, right? Because at the end of the day, I need you to to do what I need you to do. Your family and 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 everything like that. That's that's you, right? That's that's your thing and everything like that. Uh, I'm not gonna keep you away from your family. You're gonna keep yourself away from your family. I'm gonna hold you accountable to what's responsible and what you need to get. If you want to go spend time with your family, then you know what needs to be done throughout the day. Mm-hmm. Regardless if I know your family, regardless if we hang out or not or anything like that, that's still on, on you to, to keep that, you know, keep that there. For me, I I never who was it? I wanna say maybe with the first office that I ran, um, you know, we had some family stuff and everything like that and everything like that, but I was a brand new, you know, uh staff staff so I see and everything like that. So, you know, we stay close like that. You know, when I've taken over a team, I brought the family in, explained to them who I am, what I'm trying to do, blah, blah, this, that, and the other. Um, and then from there, that was it. We didn't have family functions. We weren't hanging out. We weren't doing this, that, and the other with each other, and everything like that. And um, my reasoning and my logic behind it is because I needed there to be a line. Just like I'm not a boss, I'm a staff not because I'm still in charge of an office. That's who I am, period. And the second... I never went and drank with my Marines. Like we may have had like a drink when we went to go grab food, mission makers, uh, breakfast, dinner, you know, whatever stuff like that. But I didn't go hang out with my Marines for hours on end. You know what I'm saying? For one or two reasons. One, because I didn't want them to have anything on me later on down the road to be like, well, I don't want to do this because I saw you do this. Mm. So I, I take that away. Now, after they've left the office and I'm no longer responsible for them, they're not my fucking Marines anymore. Oh, we good. You know, we we, we, we boys, you know, we, we, yeah, we're good. Yeah, yeah. You know, I have no issue at that point in time. But when I'm in that office and I'm the person who's in charge, I'm responsible for the office and the maintaining of, of everything that's within that office, I have to have that line. And there has to be a line. You can't be buddy-buddy with them because if you are buddy-buddy with them, then they're going to feel comfortable enough to not do what you expect. And for you not to freaking go crazy on them about it because, oh, well, we're going to go drinking out later anyway. So now you take that ability for you to freaking hold your brain accountable for what they're supposed to do. You take that away mm-hmm. because in five hours, you're going to be fucking out getting drunk anyway. Mm-hmm. Or you're going to be having a barbecue in, in two days. So I have no points for you for Monday, but we're having a barbecue on Sunday. I'm not saying you. I'm just saying in general. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But like that becomes a mentality like, oh, well, you know, it's cool. We're just going to have a couple beers, eat some hot dogs and hang out with the family and everything like that. It doesn't matter. I have nothing for Monday. I mean, he's here with me anyway. So what does it matter? You know what I'm saying? So I would I would always advise to not be buddy buddy with the Marines because there has to be that level of accountability. Just like you'll see a, a sports coach is not out there hanging out and partying with his freaking players, right? They don't do that. Why don't they do that? Well, they don't do that for a reason. A supervisor of a school, a superintendent, pre- uh, uh, um, freaking uh, what the hell is that guy called? A principal is not freaking hanging out with his teachers, right? 
Teachers have their own little thing they go do. Principals have their own little thing they're going to go do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everyone has that, that separation of what they're going to go do with their own individuals or the people who they're, uh, they, could, they could bitch to, right? In the Marine Corps, right, we always talk about, like, freaking, you know, you, you bitch up, you don't bitch down, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? So so I'm not going to go to my sergeant and feel really like, man, it's fucking bullshit. The command wants to do this or any other. I think that takes all credibility away from me when I say, hey, we need to do this because the command wants to do this. What I just did now, I just fucking took all that away. I say, hey, listen, an example of this would be the other day, TC. They want to hit our TC objective. I say, hey, listen, man, this is beyond my control now. Like, you guys took that control away from me where I could say, hey, listen, we're not going to hit our TC objective because we're still making mission, making AT contact. We're getting points, we're getting interviews. But the second we're not getting interviews, we're not getting points, we're not getting contracts, guess what? You take all power away from me to be like, hey, we don't have to make those TCs to hit that objective because that's sort of checking the box. We have to hit that objective now because you're not doing what we need to get done on the other end. Right, so that's different than me saying fucking command, man. They want us to freaking hit 100 percent of our freaking TC objectives. Well, guess we're fucking doing because that's what they want us to do. That's a lot different than saying it the other way. You know what I'm saying? Because like I'm saying, listen, I want to not have to hit that, but because you're not bringing your end to the table to not have to hit that, we have to not hit it now because mm-hmm. that is being required of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But now, how do I have that conversation with them, and then we go have a beer later on? So for me, 100 percent agree with freaking with the other two guys. Uh, and anyone else who says that there has to be that. So you're saying there can't be a happy medium. There the, has to no, there, there, the, the, the happy medium is we make mission, we go freaking fishing, right? Mm-hmm. I don't fish, but you know what I mean, yeah, right? Yeah. So we make mission, we go fishing, we'll go have a drink. I mean, the first time I made mission was South Jersey. We went to Buffalo Wild Wings because that's their spot. We freaking, I bought everyone a shot. You know, we ate some, we ate some food, we had some beers, and that was it. A couple of them freaking want to keep hanging out. I was like, all right, cool, man. I'm going home. See you guys. Yeah. And then freaking, they did what they need to do. The recruiters did their thing, and then I left. Because mm. that has to be their world. Yeah, they yeah, have to yeah. be able to have that ability to, to bitch and complain about me. Because yeah. I know they have a group chat. Because I had a group chat myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I know. I know there's a group chat where they fucking bitch and moan about my decisions and everything like that. And that's fine. They need that outlet. That outlet is not me. I'm yeah. not that outlet for them. Yeah. Now, if they have an issue or something and they want to bring it up, I have an open door policy. Mm. I don't close my door for anything. You want to come in and have a conversation with me. You close the door if you want no one to hear this. That's between you and everyone else. For me, you come in the door and you freaking whatever you want to say, that we'll have that conversation. Yeah. And it will be a conversation. It, and then if at the end of it, it has to be, hey, you're going to do this because I said so, then that's different. Yeah. Right? That's a different thing. However, initially, it's going to be a conversation. Let's talk about this. We're not debating. We're having a conversation. Yeah. You're giving me your opinion. I'm giving you my opinion. Right? Again, I've also had some skills tests, MC4, so, right? So, you know, what do you think is a good idea, you know? So, you know, I have certain things where I can work through that and still, for the most part, get the end result that I want. Hopefully no one heard that. But still get the end result that I want. However, I want that buy-in from the individual, so I need to have that conversation yeah. with an individual so like that. They understand where I'm coming from, where mm-hmm. my thought process is, where my logic comes from, and I can say, well, their thought process, their logic is, because we all think things differently. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I might want a skinny cat different from someone else might want a skinny cat. Yeah. I was talking to staff on campus earlier today. We're talking about a kid who's hot right now. And I'm thinking like, no, well, the kid is clean now. Let's get him on the bed. Oh, but he's overweight. Okay, cool. We'll set him up on anywhere. If you freaking RBJ, then we'll set him away. Yeah, but then for a while, so we're, like, we're talking back and forth and trying to figure it out. And then at the end of the day, he came up with another solution. I was like, all right, cool. Let's go with that. That one makes sense. We'll go with that solution. So now we came up with another solution by having a conversation back and forth. And then we came up with what we feel is going to be the best thing for that individual. Because again, all my decisions are best on what's going to be best for that individual. Right? So so again, I think it's an open conversation. I don't think there's no there's no middle ground besides, you know, uh, a work event. Right? That's not a social event. It's a work event. Um, there has to be that freaking separation. You know, uh, if you want to have the buddy-buddy relationship, you know, the closeness and everything like that, <laughs> understand that it's going to come with, with its downfalls, yeah. right? And you, you have to accept that, that when they choose not to, because it's a choice, when they choose not to do something you want them to do, there's a reason why. Yeah, yeah. Because they feel comfortable enough not to want to do it. Uh, and then how do you at that point in time hold them accountable to doing it without seeming like the asshole? Oh, well, fuck, why would I go drink with you later, man? You're a fucking asshole. You're yeah. being a douchebag to me because I didn't have this, that, and the other. Bro, it's your fucking job. Yeah, I know, but still. That was with me and Winchuck when I became the staff so I see and Winchuck was one of my recruits. Winchuck and I were both at the PCS together. So we both knew our dirt. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We both knew the grimy shit that we used to do yeah. as far as appointments, interviews, all that stuff, right? So yeah. we knew and everything like that. So there was a couple of times where like I'd be like, hey man, what's going on? What you got going on? He's like, really? You call me for that? I was like, bro, I'm sad to see. Like, I have to, I have to call you for that now. Like, he's like, what the fuck? Like, like, bro, like, I know. I'm sorry, man, but like, I gotta know. So like, there became a rip in our, our friendship because I was now in charge and then he, for lack of better words, well, not for lack of better words, because what he was, he was a subordinate. I was in charge, he was a subordinate. Yeah. So he had to freaking come up to me and tell me what was going on with certain things. But I knew him, and I knew that he was going to get what he needed to get done, regardless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I could leave him alone and be like, hey, bro, I got you. I know, I know, do your fucking thing. You know what I need. Just hit me up with what I need. Yeah. But that became a conversation, and that became how I could work that out with him. Yeah. Um, who was it? Uh, not Mendoza. I had Hong for like two weeks, I think it was, before he left. And I told mm-hmm. Hong the same thing. I was like, listen, man, I'm, I'm going to leave you alone. I, I know you know what the fuck to do. Just whatever you can give me, whatever you can give me. You know, before Santana came in. Um, Roman. When Roman was about to leave, right? Roman. I told Roman the same thing. I was like, bro, you're about to leave. Uh, everyone in the command freaking doesn't like you. Like, bro, just this is what I need from you, man. Just freaking give me this many contracts for in this many time frame. I don't care how you do it. I don't care when you do it. Just freaking just, just get this for me. And he got it to me. We had a good relationship. Um, so again, it became, it becomes a conversation, right? You know, you, you understand that the Marines on his way out the door, uh, I get it. He's going to drop his pack a little bit, or at least loosen up a little bit. Some guys just straight up drop their pack. So how do you get that Marine to keep the pack on his back and still keep staying in the fight? Mm-hmm. Having that conversation and then get him to buy in the fact that they should continue working, not for you, but really with you. And that becomes the difference between being called a boss and a staff sort of see, mm-hmm. right? Because I'm working with you. You're not working for me. Yeah. Like, what do you got that you're bringing to the team? Because it's not about me. It's about the team. So what you do and how the Marines all together interact, hang out, and stuff like that, that's more important than the Staff C being involved in that. The Staff C does not need to be involved in that. Staff C can fucking disappear. A monkey can be in the freaking room and do the freaking all that bullshit. As long as the Marines are going out there and doing what they need to do, all the other shit's going to get figured out. Yeah. But it's up to the Marines themselves to come together as a unit to want to be working for yeah, each other. Yeah. If they do that, then you're good. That's the problem. That's it is. The, that's the problem. Is so how do you build of, that, right? Yeah. So how do you build that? Because a lot of offices don't. They don't. Right. They never find that niche. They never come together. They never become a strong, right. you know, fire team squad, whatever you want to call it. Because, like, that's the reality of it. Is it's like so many people just bump so many heads. They don't care about each other. Well, actually, it's their own this. Supply. How does it happen in the fleet? How does a fire team in the fleet come together? Do they hang out together all so, the time? They're, yeah, yeah. They, they go through the same trauma and troubles and, and training and everything like that, all the teeth, right? They yeah. go through all that stuff all together, and that builds up that relationship. Think about recruit training. Yeah. When you're in boot camp, you have these freaking random ass dudes from all across the East Coast, yeah. well, East of Mississippi, right? From everywhere, and you guys became close, you guys became a tight knit group. And it's like, well, how the hell did that happen? Well, it's because of all the fire you guys had to go through, and you had to lean on each other. Yeah. So then, when you're a, a big thing that I used to like to do, uh, or that I do with South Jersey is like, hey, who are you going to go AC? What other Marine are you going to go AC with? I get it, you're going to be out of your sector for AC, but you know what? You're going to be with somebody else. So now you're building a relationship with that individual. Staff Sergeant Davis, uh, right now is Brunson, Staff Sergeant IC, and uh, Staff Sergeant Jackson needs to go AC and out all together. And I loved it, right? Because it brought them together as a team and it allowed them to then help each other out and going out there. Yeah. Same thing I was telling you guys when I was a mom. I was like, freaking. Who's going to go out there in AC with Alfred? Hey, Cuevas, you're going out there with him, right? Smith, freaking Murphy, you guys are going out together, right? And you're going to switch it up. You have each Marine freaking go out with each other, and that is how you freaking start to build the team. Yeah. That's how you start to build that bond together to where you're going out there and you're sweating, you're bleeding, and you're doing all those different things with those guys. Mm-hmm. That's why, I probably shouldn't say this, but that's why Jersey's not as good as Jersey can be right now. Because all hands is, we're going to go in, we're going to do training, and then everyone go back out to your sector and you go find someone to join the Marine Corps. Well, where's the PT before that? Where's the sweat before that? Where's the competition? Yeah. Where's us fighting against ops and headquarters, you know, as as freaking all the recruiters who were like, oh, man, those guys in the ivory tower. Here's our chance to get back at you in some sort of competitive sport. Yeah. In a fun-natured way, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was, like, my favorite thing about our hands. Yeah. We get to compete against headquarters. Here's a chance yeah. to beat headquarters. Or like, that's all we like, wanted. All we wanted was to beat headquarters yeah, in anything. Because yeah. it felt good yeah. to finally get something back on the guys who didn't have to go through the same struggles that we were going yeah. through. Right? And that is what made Jersey so successful, amongst other things. But that's one of the things that made Jersey successful, that we sweat and bled and fought together yeah. as a team 
all throughout the state, no matter where you were. Yeah, yeah. Because I knew you guys in other different areas, mm-hmm. not because you were a top recruiter, but because we had to do PT together, and we yeah. had to mix up teams, and we had to freaking be on each other's team. And who are you? Who are you? Oh, we say, oh, okay, oh, I got you, got you. All right, cool. Now, now we're freaking learning yeah. about other people and everything like that. Stanley, because you're building. Yeah, you yeah. know what I'm saying? I remember Murillo in Jersey City. I never knew he was a basketball player. He's over there freaking ball, and I was like, damn, this is good. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So you see those kind of things, you know, and you're like, oh man, like. I'm learning, I'm meeting other people. Yeah, and that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. I, I brought it up on. numerous times, but again, I, it's not, I can only do so much, right? Yeah. It's not my decision. I'm not in that leadership position to make those decisions, yeah. right? Uh, that's not up to me. I've suggested and I've thrown out there several times. However, comma, it's not up to me to make yeah, those yeah. final decisions, but I've made my voice known since I've been back in Jersey. I made my voice known a lot. A lot. Um, <laughs> And they can't keep me out of Jersey now, so I think I'm safe. At least not for another two years. So, uh, but I retire in three, so I'll, I'll be okay anyway. Um, but like, I'm at the point now in my career to where, you know, I'm more comfortable with speaking up about how I feel about certain things in a respectful manner, of yeah. course, uh, than maybe I was before when I did talk about certain things or I did speak up about certain things. I did it from a more, <clears throat> I know better kind of uh, feeling, uh, background, maybe not too experienced, but it also wasn't very received well mm-hmm. by, well, I mean, I'll just say Major Sharper. It wasn't yeah. received well by Major Sharper. Uh, friggin', you know, Major Campbell received it perfectly fine. Um, you know, friggin', Major Smith, I didn't get to deal with too much, but he was scary as hell anyway. Uh, Major <laughs> Ogden received it perfectly fine. Um, you know, so so those guys are definitely good examples of, of, uh, of people who, you know, who received it, who received Major Goldboy in Oregon, outstanding. Uh, you know, received it. You know, received it really good and everything like that. And a major family right now. He's been receiving me too, pretty, really good as well. So, so again, you know, when I have a good relationship and I could speak openly and, and give my opinion about certain things from based off of my experience, that's what I'm bringing to the table. I'm not bringing like my opinion because I think it's a better idea. Yeah. I'm, bringing, I'm bringing my opinion because this was worked in the past and yeah. could this work now? Well, yeah, Let's and see. you've been here. So you were here for three. So you've been here a cumulative of what six years? Yeah. Something. Now you're seventh. Yeah. So like you know Jersey. Yeah. yeah. In both times we were in Jersey. Yeah. Jersey was at the top. Yeah. So you know what Jersey looks like when it was at the top. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Well, do you have anything that you want to end off with? Any bits of wisdom? Anything you want to just bits of wisdom? Oof. Anything you want? I'm, I'm like the last person that has any, any <laughs> bits of wisdom. I, I kind of just uh go by the seat of my pants and kind of figure out as I go along. Um, I, I was talking to Sasha and Davis the other night because he was kind of upset about some things that happened. Uh, and um, you know, I, I told him like, you know, you control, right? I, I think I've used that yeah, word yeah, several yeah. times already. Uh, you control what you do on a daily basis. You control what your wings are able to do or not able to do. I was like, if your family is important to you and your family is a priority to you, then every decision you make needs to be based around making your family a priority. So don't tell me that you're upset that you missed your daughter's recital. Why didn't you go? Well, the Marines, okay, well, why didn't you go? Because that was your choice of not going. I'm not saying you're a bad father, but you made a choice on not to go. It's like I made a choice of not going to certain events for my son because yeah. I'd rather be in the office focusing on the Marines, pushing the Marines, everything like that. But at what point am I going to say, well, I didn't go to this or that event with my family because I chose not to go because instead of holding my Marines accountable to what you need to do or briefing my Marines on, hey, check it out, I'm leaving to go do this. I need this done by then. If it's not done by then, then you're staying till this time to get that done. Period. Done. End of discussion. When am I doing that? So for those on recruiting duty, uh, if you're either a camp scene recruiter or if you're uh, a staff so I see control you control your effort right you control everything you do on a daily basis control what you can control that's that's like my number one thing that i've said freaking for almost every single mission that i've ever given the first thing control what you can control you only control your efforts you only control your prospecting ability that's what you can control you control that that's everything you need to control everything else is going to work itself out everything else is going to figure itself out everything else is going to work out exactly the way it's going to work out as long as you're giving forth all your effort and your control don't make fear-based decisions, right? Don't make comfort-based decisions. It's more comfortable for me to sit behind the phones as opposed to going out there and ain't seeing it. Okay, well, if, if that's the case, then you're never going to be successful, right? So don't make comfort-based decisions and don't make decisions out of fear. I'm going to close out a PCS because I'm afraid the Marines aren't going to work when they're out there by themselves. Or I'm too lazy to go drive up there myself to make sure the Marines are good. Keep that PCS open. Train your Marines. Hold them accountable. FaceTime them, Zoom them, whatever. If you really need to freaking see them, that they're doing what they need to do, which Marines need to be checked on, 
Don't get me wrong, they do. Because Marines are crazy. I know I had the crazy stuff with the PCS. So I'm fully aware that Marines need to be checked on, right? So so it's like, got that. Check that. But don't close it down because of that reason. When you're in that, that situation where you have Marines going over mental health, mental health is huge. If you have a Marine who has any kind of mental health issue or you think he has a mental health issue, get that Marine the freaking help they need. That's like one of the biggest and the worst things that we do as men as a whole and, and as Marines as a whole to not get the mental health. I go to a psychologist. I, I talk to a guy, Dr. Smith. I've been talking to him since July of last year. I'm on a three-week schedule now as opposed to I was on a, a bi-weekly schedule before, so I've gotten better. But it, it's good to talk to somebody who, who who's unbiased and has nothing to do with recruiting or family or anything like that and is going to give you, you know, uh, advice and advice advice, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's giving me unbiased. He's giving me psychological advice on how to deal with certain situations, how to deal with anxiety or depression and stuff like that because those things are real, right? So how do you deal with those kind of things? What do you, what can you do to work with your, work through those kind of situations, right? So he gives me those things that helps me out. So when you have a Marine that brings that kind of stuff up, don't shoot, shoot it. Be like, hey, listen, big time, military one source, go find yourself somebody, set that up in your schedule, and then go go see someone. Don't get me wrong. I still need a appointment for tomorrow. However, you know what time that's supposed to go. So mm-hmm. you know that between this time and this time, you do your freaking yeah, job. Yeah, yeah. Go get the help you need, and then make sure you have what you need for the next day. That's possible. Yeah. That's not impossible. Yeah. That's a choice, right? Yeah. So get those, those those Marines with the help they need and everything like that. You know, a Marine has something going on with his family. Hold them accountable to, hey, listen, you want to go freaking be with your family, right? This is what I need done. If they don't get that done, still let them go out, hang out with their family, go do what they need to do with their family. But let them know, I'm getting that date back on the back end. Well, guess what you're doing? You're coming in on Sunday because you couldn't give me what I needed. And that's your fault, not my fault. Yeah. I'm not the one forcing you to come back in on Sunday. You're forcing yourself to come back in on Sunday because you didn't even do what you did. I still allow you to go do whatever you need to go do with your family, did I not? Yes, you did. Okay, well, I'm holding up my end of the deal. What are you going to hold up your end? Yeah. So, again, that's like a conversation piece. That's, you know, that's going through the individual and really kind of helping them understand. And and, and it, it goes a long way. So, talking to someone like a human being and trying to treat them like a human being, uh, that kind of stuff, it, it definitely goes it goes a long way. And being patient. You know, those are the, the little pieces of nuggets. All right. Well, things that I've learned. You know all right. Saying? So, control what you can control. That's it. All right. That's it. It's a wrap.